as windy, but just as mild on Friday. Again, temperatures 14, 15, 16, perhaps even 17 degrees Celsius. It will be breezy, but these temperatures are pretty remarkable for November. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let well, him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Hello everybody, you're with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Don't you just love it when a little bit of breaking news drops as soon as you come on air? The nurses strike, people. It's actually happening. We're going to get stuck right into that between now and six o'clock. We are getting reports just in that nurses will strike. A strike is on, apparently, so that will be the big one for us today. It's happening. Do you back the strike? Get in touch, GBviews at GBnews.uk. Loads of different angles there. We're going to be speaking to members of the medical community who support the strike, who oppose the strike, or also as well, I want to hear from you, the, the NHS's customers, I suppose, the patients. Can you get your chemotherapy treatment? Are you worried that it will be happening? Because it won't just be nurses as well. We are hearing that it'll be people like cleaning staff and quotes, unquote, the backroom staff, as it were, in our NHS. Do you think it's justified? Do you think they deserve what will amount to, roughly speaking, a 17% pay rise on top of the two pay rises they've had in the last couple of years? A big, big, big question mark over how much this nation owes them as a result of their wonderful service during the coronavirus pandemic. Lots to talk about there. We'll do the absolute lot of it, as we always do, right here with me. Get those views coming in there, that breaking news. Nurses will strike. GBviews at gbnews.uk. On top of that, we've got migrant hotels. When will that misery end in your area? Nigel Farage will join me shortly on this, but also on whether or not he thinks it's the end of the road for Trump in America. Who better to talk to when it comes to all of that stuff? The man himself, the big man, Nigel Farage, right here on this show very, very shortly. We also have... Is Just Stop Oil a dangerous cult? Some nutter in York tried to turn King Charles into an omelette and Braverman wants more police on the streets and to stop the woke brigade hampering them. On that, police chiefs are angry with Suella Braverman. What they essentially want is police officers training to get out of the classroom and onto the streets. Do you think you really need a degree, a top degree, to be a Bobby on the beat? Do you actually want them to fast track these coppers to clamp down on crime? So there's a huge amount to talk about here, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to be doing the absolute lot of it. Just to run you through again, before I go to the news now, we're going to be that big breaking news, which is, of course, the nurses' strike. We are also going to be talking about Just Stop Oil. Are they a cult? And a bit of this from Swella Braverman. Broken windows matter. There is no such thing as petty crime. Any tolerance of low-level disorder and crime will only beget more serious crime. 
Yeah, it's okay. Get these views coming in. GB views at gbnews.uk. That big breaker so far on this show, which is, of course, that nurses are going to strike. How do you feel about that? Let's throw it over now, though, to Rosie Wright with your latest headlines before we come back and we do the absolute loss of it. A very good afternoon to you. Three minutes past three. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date. The Royal College of Nursing has announced its first national strike action in its 106-year history. The RCN says the strike will affect the majority of NHS employers in the UK as nurses take action against pay levels and patient safety concerns. The union's 300,000 members were urged to vote for the action. Emergency care, though, will not be affected. The government has said it has contingency plans for dealing with the action. The Prime Minister insists he didn't know about specific concerns over Sir Gavin Williamson when he appointed him in his cabinet. The MP left his post last night saying allegations of bullying and his conduct had become a distraction to the good work of government. Sir Gavin denies any wrongdoing. Rishi Sunak told PMQs it was absolutely right Sir Gavin resigned. But the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, questioned the Prime Minister's judgment allowing Sir Gavin to be a cabinet minister in the first place. Everyone in every walk of life should be abiding by the proper employment procedures and making sure they are acting in the way that we would expect of anybody. And in public life, the bar should be even higher. But I'm afraid with Gavin Williamson, that's a specific case of somebody who should never have been appointed to government, a terrible reflection on the judgment of the Prime Minister because he was already under investigation for this when the appointment was made. And to me, it, why these people appointed to government? Well, it's because that's the Conservative Party and there's no way any Prime Minister can... can forge a majority out of what we see in Parliament from the Conservative Party without taking these risks. And that is why they're incapable of providing the stability the country needs. The Home Secretary is urging police chiefs to focus on what she calls common sense policing and not politically correct distractions. Speaking at a conference in Westminster, Swella Braverman said the public expects the police to be tackling crime, not debating gender on Twitter. Ms Bravan also urged the force to reconsider police action that could be seen as woke. Results for the US midterms are being declared, with some states still too close to call. If the Democrats lose either the House or the Senate, that would enable the Republicans to limit President Joe Biden's ability to pass laws. The results out so far show Republicans are on course to gain control of the House of Representatives. The race for the Senate, though, is on a knife edge. It could be days before the final results are announced because of the high number of postal votes. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is expected to announce whether he'll run again for president. The former White House senior adviser, Amorosa Magnet Newman, says Mr Trump is surprised by the initial results. You know, I talked to an advisor that's in Trump's camp who stated very clearly that Donald Trump was disappointed with the results of very key races that he thought that they had in the bag. And so I think that his camp is going to have to go back, regroup and come up with a new strategy as to how they're going to move forward. Otherwise, he could be very vulnerable in his quest to return back to the Oval Office. Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, has announced plans to cut more than 11,000 jobs worldwide. The cuts will reduce the size of the workforce by 13%. The founder and chief executive, Mark Zuckerberg, has apologised for what he described as some of the most difficult changes in the company's history. It's understood 400 employees could lose their jobs at the European headquarters in Ireland. A 23-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of a public order offence after throwing eggs at King Charles and the Queen Consort in York. The incident happened when they arrived at York Minster to unveil a statue of the late Queen Elizabeth. It's understood a protester threw three eggs at them, all of which missed the couple. Several police officers at Micklegate Bar were seen restraining a suspect on the ground immediately after the incident. Two people have been arrested and a police officer, I'm sorry, four people have been arrested and a police officer has been injured after responding to a climate protest on the M25 this morning. Essex police said there was a collision between a motorbike and two lorries in a rolling roadblock that had been imposed because of an activist on the motorway. This is now the third day of action on the UK's busiest road. Just Stop Oil say around 10 of its supporters climbed onto overhead gantries in multiple locations along the motorway. The Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, told GB News protesters are causing mass disruption. We have COP27 going on. If you are serious and want to be constructive about climate change, about making those changes, then if you are serious about that, you should be going to COP27. You should be constructively engaging with that dialogue, um, not sticking yourself to parts of the M25. 
You're up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it develops. Now back to Patrick. Yes, welcome back, people. I tell you what, a little bit of breaking right at the top of the show. In fact, I was just walking into the studio when we heard it drop. It turns out that nurses will strike. UK nurses have voted to strike, meaning that the majority of NHS employers across the country will be going on strike. It'll be timed, classic, just in time for before Christmas, which is traditionally when the NHS, one would argue, is at its most overwhelmed. And we've been hearing, of course, about the flu pandemic and the COVID pandemic and all of this stuff. Yep, time for maximum damage. Time for absolute maximum damage. The Royal College of Nursing Union has confirmed this. Thousands of British nurses will strike over their demands for better pay. A little bit of context about what they actually want. They would like a 5% pay rise on top of inflation. Inflation currently around the 12% mark. Therefore, it's roughly speaking a 17% pay rise. We spoke about this a lot on Monday, didn't we, when it appeared that, frankly, we were going to end up in this situation. Well, now we actually are here. I want to hear from you. I'm just going to do a little bit of live stuff that maybe you don't get on most of the broadcasters here because one of the big things about this show in particular is the interaction that I get from you wonderful people whether you're at home or uh, watching on your TV or in your car or whatever gbviews at gbnews.uk get in touch with your personal views on this strike and how you are concerned that it might affect your health care and if you leave your details in that email we will try to get you on the show because I really want to hear from you. That's gbviews at gbnews.uk. Get in touch on your views on this nursing strike. How will it potentially affect your health care? Do you support the nurses? Do you think that we owe them as a result of their work during the coronavirus crisis? Were they underpaid before that? So I want to get stuck into all of that with you, bring you all along for, well, what is frankly possibly quite a miserable ride considering the nurses' strike. But there we go. We'll have more on this moving story throughout the afternoon. That's the big one for us today. The sound of running orders being shredded in the background is probably what you can hear behind me there. The nurses' strike will go out. Ahead. Our political reporter Olivia Utley is in Westminster for us. Olivia, what's the latest then, please? Well, yes, it's hard to overestimate the scale of this strike. The Royal College of Nursing have said that 300,000 of its members could be going on strike. Now, of course, this is against a backdrop of 7 million cases waiting, NHS cases, people waiting for their operations, lots of them in pain and discomfort. So there are plenty in Westminster today who feel that this is absolutely the wrong time for the nurses' strike, and it will mean that real people up and down the country are going to suffer. Of course, of course, the other thing to bear in mind is that the NH the autumn statement is next week and we know that the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are considering swathes of cuts across the public sector and to public spending while the NHS is asking for another £7 billion in funding. So we could see a situation, if the nurses in their strike get their way, where even a uh, even higher proportion of public spending goes on the NHS. It's already more than half, and it could be much more than that very soon. Those who are supportive of the strike point out, of course, how valuable nurses were during the coronavirus pandemic, and also point out that it is actually getting quite difficult for the UK to recruit nurses at the moment, which normally is a sign that there is a problem with the pay, unlike, for example, the train driver strike, where there are always too many applicants for train driver roles than, than roles available. So that is the argument for raising their pay. It's also quite difficult for nurses who have to go through a university degree to become a nurse yeah. and end up having to take on an awful lot of debt because of that. So one way possibly for the government to get away through this crisis is to find a different way for nurses to train which doesn't involve a degree or else get the NHS to, to front up that student debt instead of pushing it on the country's pay books. Yeah, Olivia, look, thank you very much. Olivia Rutley there, our political correspondent in Westminster. If you're just joining us, that big breaking news tag at the bottom of your screen there is correct. Nursing strike will go ahead. As we understand it, more than 300,000 members of the Royal College of Nursing were balloted and they have announced now that the strike will go ahead. It will possibly take place before Christmas, so in the run-up to Christmas. Traditionally, of course, one of the biggest times of the NHS is at its most stretched, so maximum negative impact. It would be the first 
strike in its 106-year history, the Royal College of Nursing, that is. And the scale of this will be vast because there are people in there who are not just nurses, as we understand it anyway. There are people who are, I don't like using the phrase backroom staff, but you get what I mean when it comes to things like cleaners, etc., porters potentially, who will be involved with this as well. The big line coming out is, don't worry too much because non-urgent stuff won't be too affected. But when you look down the list of what is classed as non-urgent, it does include things like chemotherapy treatments, it does include things like dialysis treatments as well. And I think anyone who is going through or about to go through chemotherapy or dialysis would argue that's pretty flipping urgent, and I would be inclined to agree with them. It is fundamentally an issue of pay, and that pay is what they want, is an increase of, roughly speaking, 17%. They had an increase of around 4% earlier this year and an increase of around 3% the year before that. However, there's that thing of in real terms, which is why you hear a lot of nurses and doctors come on shows like this and say they've had a pay cut. They've not had a pay cut, but in real terms, they say that it has fallen when it compares to 20 years previous. Now, there's also an issue when it comes to recruitment. So the fact that they're being, as they would see it, underpaid and overworked, traditional reasons to strike in pretty much any industry. Some solutions to this, which we're going to tease through throughout the course of this show. Olivia there mentioned university degrees. Should a nurse have to have a university degree in order to go into actual practice? That can saddle them with debt. A couple of solutions there, biff the university degrees or biff their student loan. Maybe make sure that when they go into nursing, they're not having to pay off a debt as well. Could we, in the short term now, rope in the military? the medical military, that is, of course, to try and plug this gap. Could we, of course, pay them more? What do you think about that? Do you want to give in to their demands? Do you think they might settle for a little bit less? Should they not be paid anymore? We are all skint, apparently. Another solution, get rid of some of the layers of management. Are there too many people on too much money who are not at the coalface when it comes to our NHS? Are they your higher-ups, as it were, your pen pushers, some would say? I know the usual diversity managers thing is always wheeled out, yes. That is one that I suspect maybe people could get rid of. But are there also several different layers of management that could go in order to make way for nurses? What do you think about all of this? GBviews at gbnews.uk. Already loads of you have been getting in touch. And I'm going to put out another little plea, because, believe it or not, we did have a problem running order of this show, of course, but now, with breaking news, that gets ripped up. So I want to hear from you with the People's Channel, and I want your views on whether or not your care is going to be affected, whether or not you think nurses should have a pay rise. Look, we can't get around the overarching point of this, which is that if, I dare say, you went on strike, or if I went on strike, people wouldn't die. In fact, when if I went on strike, it would be questionable whether or not anyone would notice. But if nurses go on strike, they can bracket it any way they want, rope in agency staff, we'll plug gaps in our services, and patients won't be too badly affected. But the reality is, in the run-up to Christmas, when they're swamped anyway, you would have thought that people will die as a result of this. And should they have this on their conscience? I had a GP on on Monday who it's fair to say I did not get on with, actually, and he was of the view that actually we need to look at the bigger picture when it comes to all of this. Bit of short-term pain for long-term gain for nurses. I personally don't think that's good enough. Try saying to somebody who can't get their chemotherapy treatment or their dialysis or get a lump checked or whatever that they need to see the bigger picture. Loads of you in the inbox now. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Let's try and get some of you on air, if we can, so leave your details in these emails. Virginia says they should not be allowed to strike. If anyone dies because of this, it will be close to murder. I agree with you. They are on good money compared to some others. Now, this, Virginia, is one of the big questions, because I had someone on in my inbox earlier on that said uh, she claims, anyway, to work at, at a checkout at a, at a shop, and she said that she worked throughout the vast majority of the pandemic. She said she was on around £10.20 an hour, possibly a little bit more than that. No sign of a pay rise there. So she worked through the pandemic, OK? So that would mean that she was at risk as well and at risk of taking things home to her family and, you know, infecting her loved ones with coronavirus. Possibly not as much as nurses. That much is obvious. But still a risk and a service and a key worker during the pandemic. No pay rise in sight for that particular lady. So are they on good money? You're looking at an average salary, salary, easy for me to say, of around 32 grand. That can climb as you do indeed climb the ladder. Is that good enough, do you think? Do you think they should settle for that amount of money? Robert says, hopefully now the nurses are striking, their work will finally be appreciated. They do so much and don't get paid enough. Robert, just on that one, though, 17%. 
is an absolute whopper, isn't it? On top of the 4% and on top of the 3%. Robert, I suspect that the Royal College of Nursing feels as though they didn't do a good enough job of negotiating the pay rise early doors and that now, with the cost of living crisis hitting and inflation hitting, they think, mm, God, we better do something drastic. I suppose maybe that is one of the issues there. Jean has been on. I was a nurse for almost 51 years. We never went on strike. It was an unprofessional thing to do. Nurses today should be ashamed. Everyone is going short financially. And, Jean, I suspect that you have chimed in there to the beating heart of what a lot of people in this country are thinking right now. Sympathetic towards nurses. Nurses do a great job. Nurses save lives and they can be there for you in your moment of need. But if you do decide to go into a profession and the pay scale for that profession is available online, you can Google it. You and I can now Google how much a nurse is paid and what they can expect to be paid throughout the course of their career. When you sign up to do a university degree, you know what that degree costs. Therefore, you know the amount of student debt that you are going to be saddled with and how long for. And you still decide to do that job. Then, actually, OK, when inflation hits and it affects everybody, do you have the right to then strike, especially if that means that people won't get potentially life-saving care? I personally come down on the side of the fact that I think it should be illegal for nurses to strike. GB Views at GBNews.UK. Get in touch on that one. It is a massively hot topic and one that we're going to be sticking with throughout the course of this show. We're going to be speaking to medical professionals who agree with the strike and those who disagree with the strike. So we're going to get a massive range of views on this very topic. But I do want to hear from you, ladies and gentlemen, because within the last few minutes, the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, has said that nurses voting to strike was, quote, disappointing. He tweeted... It is disappointing that some RCN, that's Royal College of Nursing, members voted for industrial action. We accepted the recommendations of the independent NHS pay review body in full and have given over 1 million NHS workers a pay rise of at least 1,400 quid this year on top of a 3% rise last year. I'm hugely grateful for the hard work and dedication of NHS staff, including nurses. That's why supporting the NHS and social care workforce to care for patients is one of my priorities. And we've already recruited 30,000 of the 50,000 more nurses we promised by 2024. He continued. But union demands for a 17.6% pay settlement, 17.6%, are around three times what millions of people outside the public sector will typically receive and simply aren't reasonable or affordable. My priority is to keep patients safe during any strikes, minimise disruption and ensure emergency services continue to operate. What do you make of that, ladies and gentlemen? Some key points there from Steve Barclay, who has basically said that they already gave a £1,400 pay rise earlier this year on top of a 3% pay rise the year before. Now... The Royal College of Nursing wants a 17.6% pay rise. They have confirmed today that the strike will go ahead right in the run-up to Christmas. And when it came to the pay side of it, he says that those demands are unreasonable and, as he put it, the vast majority of people will not be getting this kind of money in their normal lives, OK, in their normal jobs. So non-public sector workers will not be getting anything like that kind of whopping pay rise to cope, not just with inflation, but also a bit on top as well. In terms of the recruitment, which is another big issue, nurses are saying we can't recruit people because it's uh, an, an unfashionable job, I suppose, it's unfavourable, it can be a dirty business and they're not paid enough. He said they promised to recruit 50,000 nurses by 2024 and they already have managed 30 thousand of those. Like I've said, get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk, because it's you that really make the world go round here, and we want to hear from you. And I am going to be speaking to medical professionals later, and it would be really nice if I could put some of your questions and your concerns to them, so they can actually humanise it a bit. I think sometimes, from my experience of speaking to a lot of GPs or nurses or whatever, or unionists, frankly, I don't really think a lot of the time they deal that well with hearing questions from normal people and real-life stories and real-life concerns. So it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we could maybe ask them a little bit about you and your concerns and get them to, metaphorically, at least look you in the eye and justify their position on this. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Get in touch. 
hundreds of them flying in already. I'll go to those shortly. We're going to move away from this quickly now. We'll be returning to it throughout the show, but to another issue close to your heart, and that, of course, is law and order, because the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is facing calls from a number of police and crime commissioners across the country to get new officer recruits out of the classroom and onto the beat. They say that regulations requiring new recruits to undertake three years of study is likely to endanger the government's flagship 20,000 police uplift programme. So, recruiting... Let's be honest, the 20,000 police officers they got rid of a little while earlier. The letter sent to her by police and Crown Commissioners comes as she addressed them face-to-face -face at a conference within the last hour. So Bravman took to the stand, that's right, and she looked some police officers in the eye and told them what she was going to do. Let's have a bet. We have recruited more than 50,000 additional officers, so we are well on the way to 20,000. I've met some of these new officers, and it's great to see their enthusiasm uh, for their new careers, some not far from here in the safer neighbourhood team within the Met. The College of Policing has been working hard to raise the standards of initial entry and ensure that officers are equipped to meet the challenges of policing today. And we know that to build public confidence, we must draw from the widest pool of talent across all sections of society. So that was Suella Braverman there. Just a couple of key points. Clearly, she's essentially faced a lot of heat relating to the channel migrant crisis. Just FYI, Nigel Farage is on relatively soon as well. We're going to be talking about that and the Trump stuff with him on top of that. But this is a big thing. So police and crime commissioners have not really been happy with the way that Suella Bravman, or I think it's fair to say other Home Secretaries as well, have gone about handling policing when it comes to recruits. Is there a need and a push for young trainee police officers to spend a huge amount of time in the classroom learning how to be a copper as opposed to actually practically doing it? Is that holding us back when it comes to tackling, frankly, spiralling crime, especially violent crime? Do you think that Suella Bravman can get these bobbies out of the classroom and straight onto the beat? Would you feel more comfortable if the bloke who was a woman, of course, it's a modern world, who was investigating a murder or a robbery at your house or whatever, had a degree? Or would you like them to have more practical experience? To discuss this, I am joined by Suffolk Police and Crime Commissioner Tim Passmore and Norman Brennan, a retired police officer with 31 years service. Thank you very much. Tim, I'll start with you, because it is police and crime commissioners who have apparently really been up in arms about all of this. Let's just get down to brass tacks on it. Is your main concern that it's taking too long to get someone to sign a form that says they want to be a police officer and then getting them out actually being a police officer? Yes, so at the moment the, the system takes up to three years by the time they're fully qualified. I'm not saying that people shouldn't have a degree. What I was very pleased to hear this afternoon from the Home Secretary is that she will look again at this so that there could be a blend of those who want to have a degree fair enough, but also attracting other people who don't wish to go through the degree training process, which, let's face it, does cost a heck of a lot of cash, taxpayers' money, and I think blending the two together would be a, a big improvement. Then we can attract people from all backgrounds. We want good training, but we also need good, practical, on the beat, common sense to with it. Well, you've mentioned that, and I'm glad, because you're just moving me on now to Norman Brennan, who is that retired police officer with 31 years' experience. Another thing that Suella Braverman seems to be big on, apart from now trying to fast-track a bit of recruitment, is the idea that police will have the confidence that they can act firmly and strongly without fear of falling foul of political correctness. How important is that? Sorry, is that a question to me? Yes, Norman, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, it's very important. A police officer, when recruited, and let me tell you the type of recruits we should uh, be getting before I answer that question there, is that uh, we should have recruits of police officers with the only degree they need is a degree of common sense. We should have a mixture right across the board, and whoever th Ill thought through the degree-only entry didn't think, very sensibly, because it was one of the worst decisions I've made, and it's actually really upset the police apple cart. Uh, many people that would be very fine police officers now no longer really would wish to apply. And often, as you rightly say, they have to wait for years. Political correctness, wokeness, red tape, bureaucracy has tied the police service up into knots. Most police officers can't do the job that they once wished to join. The 
uh, nice glossy brochures about what policing is really all about. Oh, yeah. uh, we've certainly seen in uh, a different light once they join. We have a police service, sadly, that uh, is on its knees. Um, okay. It feels impotent, and there are too many angry, belligerent people in society that, uh, sadly, make policing a very difficult well, job. And it appears we to be it appears to be getting worse, Norman. It appears to be getting worse. I think there's a fundamental lack of respect for law and order in this country right now. I know that video cameras and phones, etc., are a lot more prevalent these days than they were a good few years ago, but I'm sure there's been a sharp increase of essentially young people doing things like nicking police officers' hats in McDonald's and all of this stuff, that kind of stuff, that, and worse, by the way, I mean, actually using knives against them. Tim Passmore, a police and crime commissioner, I'll just throw it back over to you for this one. Why aren't we recruiting people who've just left the military? Or are we? Well, well we, we are, and right. um, they're a very valuable resource. They've got world experience, practical people, and as I said earlier, we need the blender too. We get people from all sorts of backgrounds, and that is definitely to be welcomed, but we've got to cast the net wider. And I do agree with the Home Secretary with the comments of removing red tape. She said that she would take the scissors to red tape. And I absolutely agree with that. I spoke to some officers out in Ipswich yesterday. They want to get on with the job. They don't want the bureaucracy, the red tape, the form filling. And, you know, the funny thing is, since we've had the advance of technology, it seems there's even more paperwork involved. So we've got to get back to community policing. We've got to remember also, however, that the pattern of crime has changed. Far more fraud, far more online crime, a lot more what they call hidden harm behind closed doors, domestic violence, abuse, addiction. So, on. so we've got to get the blend right, and I think there's a lot of progress to make. OK, very quickly and very finally, Norman, you do not think that the public would have more confidence in the fact that a police officer has got a degree than someone who hasn't? Do you think there's a stigma attached to that? Well, people have got degrees uh, that have made fine police officers. We've got people with degrees that can pass any exam uh, mm. under the sun, yet doesn't mean that they will make firm good leaders. But the caveat to all of this is we need police officers that are recruited. Two references that are personally visited. The officer is personally and stringently interviewed and they go to a residential police training school for 14 weeks. We can then root out some of those that should never have joined. The sad okay. reality is now some people join the police service without having a face to face interview. And when yeah, you look shocking. at the dreadful slurs about some of those that have committed dreadful crimes, which are not slurs against those officers, they're absolutely dreadful crimes that they committed. Unless we get our act together and recruit the right type of people, sadly, some will join, get all the headlines for their criminal behaviour to the detriment of the tens of thousands of hard-working men and women that risk their lives day in and day out. Yeah, 100%. Look, both of you, thank you very, very much. That was Suffolk Police and Crown Commissioner Tim Passmore and Norman Brennan, retired police officer with 31 years service. Just reacting to that news that Suella Bravman has briefed a load of police chiefs today. She wants to fast-track a bit of recruitment, so less time spent in the classroom, more time Bobby's on the beat. And... The big question there is about whether or not they really need university degrees or a degree course to go through. As you heard there from a retired police officer with a lot of common sense, it's that point. They need a degree in common sense and they need to have that woke red tape slashed in order for them to do their job. Coming up, as Lord Frost tells GB News in an exclusive interview with our very own Liam Halligan, he believes that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is a hypocrite well, the government is a hypocrite, for importing US fracked gas whilst not allowing it in the UK. I am going to ask and use that as a launch pad for whether or not we think it's time to frack in this country. I'll also be putting your thoughts on the news. That was the big breaking news for us throughout the course of this show. We're going to be speaking to medical professionals on both sides of this fence. Nurses will strike in the run-up to Christmas. We're going to be hearing all about that. Your views, OK? We want your views to come in so we can actually put them to some of those medical professionals. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Some people won't get chemo, some people won't get dialysis. Nurses want around a 17.5% pay rise. Where do you stand on all of that? But now it's your latest headlines with Rosie. Good afternoon, 3.32. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date. The Royal College of Nursing has announced its first national strike action in its 106-year history. The RCN says the strike will affect the majority of NHS employers in the UK as nurses take action against pay levels and patient safety concerns.
The union's 300,000 members were urged to vote for industrial action. Emergency care will not be impacted. The Health Secretary Steve Barclay has described the decision to strike as disappointing. The Prime Minister insists he didn't know about specific concerns over Sir Gavin Williamson's behaviour when he appointed him to the Cabinet. Well, the MP left his post last night, saying allegations of bullying and his conduct had become a distraction to the good work of the government. Sir Gavin denies any wrongdoing. Speaking at Prime Minister's questions, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, questioned Rishi Sunak's judgment. Mr Speaker, the member for South Staffordshire spent years courting the idea he can intimidate others, yeah. blurring the lines to normalise bullying behaviour. Yeah. It's precisely why the Prime Minister gave him a job. Yeah. The truth is simple. He's a pathetic bully, but he would never get away with it if people like the Prime Minister didn't hand him power. So does he regret his decision to make him a government minister? Mr Speaker, I obviously regret appointing someone who has had to resign in these circumstances. But I think... But I think what the British people would like to know is that when situations like this arise, that they will be dealt with properly. And that's why, and that's why it is absolutely right that he resigned, and it's why it is absolutely right that there is an investigation to look into these matters properly. The Home Secretary is urging police chiefs to focus on what she calls common sense policing and not politically correct distractions. Speaking at a conference in Westminster, Suella Braverman said the public expects the police to be tackling crime, not debating gender on Twitter. Ms Braverman also urged the force to reconsider police action that could be seen as woke. A 23-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of a public order offence after throwing eggs at King Charles and the Queen Consort in York. It's understood three eggs were thrown in total, all of which missed the royal couple. Several police officers at Micklegate Bar were seen restraining a suspect on the ground immediately after. Four people have been arrested and a police officer has been injured after responding to a climate protest on the M25. Essex police say there was a collision between a motorbike and two lorries in a rolling ro roadblock that had been imposed because of an activist on the motorway. It's the third day of action on the UK's busiest road. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Patrick will be back in a moment. Yes, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You can just see on my screen there that we're going to be discussing the US midterms, specifically Trump. And Nigel Farage is waiting in the wings for us, our very own Nigel Farage. Just want to give you a bit of a heads up. We managed to get former Health Secretary Alan Johnson, who's going to be coming on shortly. He's going to be coming on after Nigel, his former Labour Health Minister. And I want to put some of your questions to him, if possible. So get them coming in, gbviews at gbnews.uk, because nurses have voted to strike just in the run-up to Christmas. That's the email there, gbviews at gbnews.uk. But first, let's go without further dither and delay to Nigel Farage, the man himself, because Republicans and Democrats are locked in a tight race for control of Congress. As results are being declared in the US midterm elections, votes still being counted, but Republicans are thought likely to take control of the House of Representatives. The fight for the upper house or Senate is too close to call. Former President Donald Trump is expected to announce that he will run for president in 2024, but has he had the wind taken out of his sails a little bit? He's got former, he's got Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis snapping at his heels. He won a large victory, of course, didn't he? Let's get straight into Nigel. Nigel Farage, who is in Phoenix, Arizona, for me right now. Nigel, great stuff. Thank you. Is it the end of the road for Trump or not at all? Well, let's deal with these elections first, shall we? Um, the red wave has become a red ripple. Um, uh, and I think, you know, Republicans need to understand and assess why. At the moment, pollsters here are marred in confusion. I think I've got the answer. Oh. America never used to have to have voting, but it was introduced in 2020 during the pandemic. And so the way this election was conducted is very different to 2018. All the evidence is, if you ask people, say university students, to go to the polls on polling day, they don't bother. Sign them up for postal vote, and they all fill in their ballots in front of their friends, and virtue signal they're not going to vote for that nasty man, Mr Trump. So I have no doubt that the reason it's so close to the Senate race and the governorship, both here in Arizona and across America, is mass early voting funda fundamentally changes election results. It's why the French... Uh 
OK, all right. So, I mean, it's an interesting one, of course, isn't it? I, I suppose we've also um, seen a lot of reason. things like, you know, traditional Republican views being clamped down on campuses, etc. Some people would say, well, I suppose that's democracy. At least they're being given the right to vote. But others are now claiming that maybe the right time is now for Trump to just step aside a little bit and to allow someone like DeSantis to come into the fight. What do you make of all of that? Well, that's next week's debate, isn't it? I mean, in, for example, Pennsylvania, a million people had voted before the public debate between the two Senate candidates. The poor chap, Fetterman, from a Democrat, had a stroke in May. It was clear in the debate that actually he doesn't sadly have the mental faculties to do the job. So you may as well not have candidates and put up robots. DeSantis won because he was a good governor. DeSantis won because lots of people have left New York and gone down to Florida, who are Republican voters. And DeSantis has won because he cleaned up the electoral register, he banned ballot harvesting, and is a very impressive guy. Clearly, Donald Trump has got a lot to think about over the course of this weekend. It could be that we're headed for a titanic battle between the two men. Nigel, thank you very much. I mean, this is really important stuff that's going on over there. Just on that one, Nigel, just, just quickly, I mean, cognitive function doesn't really appear to matter too much in American politics. I, you know it a lot better than I do over there, but I balk at my TV screens and my social media feed all the time and just think, actually, sometimes I think, I wonder, the Democrats could just put a pig in a ribbon up and win somehow, couldn't they? I don't really get it, Nigel. No, well, I'm afraid first-past-the-post politics, tribal politics does that. Hey, you know, how did Gavin Williamson become a cabinet minister? Um, so you do see things like that going on. Uh, but I, you know, I just think mass early postal voting has fundamentally changed American politics, and that is the big takeout from this election. Look, Nigel, thank you very much. I'll let you crack on in Arizona. Nigel Farage, there, our very own, in Phoenix, Arizona, reacting to the result of the midterms. Lots to talk about. Results still coming in. It's on a knife edge. And what will it mean going forward for former President Donald Trump? But back to our breaking news this afternoon, because the Royal College of Nurses has confirmed that UK nurses will be going on strike over pay. And Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting has accused the government of, quote, unacceptable negligence, saying there were no strikes in the NHS during 13 years when Labour was last in government. If we were in office today, we would be ta talking with the RCN, that's the Royal College of Nurses, and doing everything we can to prevent these strikes going ahead. Government ministers spent the summer dodging calls and requests for meetings from the Royal College of Nursing. It is unacceptable negligence. The Conservatives have stopped governing and it is nurses and patients who will be made to pay the price. Joining me now for an update on the breaking news about the first ever nurses' strike in the Royal College of Nursing history is Alan Jones, industrial correspondent for the Press Association. Alan, thank you very much. I'm sure you can imagine the emails that I'm getting in my inbox now. I'm hoping you can pick through this. The nurses want, roughly speaking, a 17.6% pay rise. That's what Steve Baker has said. He's saying that they've already given them a £1,400 pay rise earlier this year on top of a 3% pay rise the year before and recruited 30,000 of the 50,000 nurses they promised to recruit by 2024. People are concerned at the impact on patient safety as a result of this nurses' strike. Will patients be massively affected? Uh, afternoon. Well, yeah, there's bound, there's bound to be an effect on this. You know, your nursing going on site. It won't just be nurses either. Um, all all the other unions representing NHS staff are currently balloting their members. So pretty soon we'll have ballot results involving ambulance drivers, porters, cleaners, physiotherapists, midwives. So you know, if 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 all these separate disputes come together before the end of the year, yes, there's going to be a massive impact. I would imagine pretty soon we'll hear about um, what kind of action the RCN is going to and um, is going to be imposing. So there'll probably be cancellations of operations. I would think non non urgent non emergency treatment will be put back at a time when there are record numbers of people waiting for treatment. So you know this is the last thing anybody wanted. The nurses don't want to be doing this either. I mean I think it's incredible we're here talking about nurses going on strike. You know that's not what they do. Well, well, yeah, and the, the question is, though, we can't get around this, the morality of it. You know, the, my big line on this is that if I went on strike, yes, OK, no-one would really care, I understand that. But the crucial point is that people wouldn't die, OK? So, if you are a nurse, and I get that maybe you want more money, 
and maybe you want better working conditions. But if you go on strike knowing that someone might not get cancer treatment and might die as a result, even if they don't die that day, they might die a bit further down the line. That's, that's a tough thing to sleep at night over, isn't it? Well, no, it is. That's the, that's the point I'm making. It's, you know, it's incredible that they have voted in such big numbers to take industrial action. One of the main messages we're getting from all the health unions now is that th they are taking action to highlight what is happening in the NHS in terms of staff shortages. You talk to any union official now, you know, and they can't believe how many people are leaving the profession. We've been getting stories about qualified nurses leaving to, to go and work in a supermarket. For the same amount of money, less stress. You know, I get that, the but then this is this is this is one of the things that I struggle to understand because the pay scale for a nurse is available online. I'm just on the RCN site here, and they're saying the average is around 33 grand, roughly speaking, around 33 grand. Look, that's not a king's ransom. Don't get me wrong at all. Certainly not for the job that they do. But anyone going into nursing is aware of that figure and aware of the amount of training and possibly student debt that they have as well. Some would say it's their own fault. Yeah, I think you're being pretty tough saying it's the, it's it's their own fault. I mean, and, and remember, these are people you know who saved lives over the last couple of years with the pandemic. These are people we were all standing outside our houses applauding um, because of their amazing efforts to tackle the pandemic. And then they've come out of that. They had to wait months before their pay rise, which was due anyway. And then they've had a pay rise way below the rate of inflation. I mean, these are probably the biggest group of workers who deserve the biggest pay rise ever, I think. Um, and I think most people think that as well. You know, and the other interesting point about this now is how much public support they will get. Be interesting to see the kind of emails you're getting mm. soon. You know, there was a strike in the Northern Ireland three years ago, and there was massive public support for nurses yeah. then. And I, it's my, very split. I guess there'll be support now. It's it's very it's very split. I mean, to, to, to be honest with you, my inbox, the vast majority of what I'm getting at the minute is anti this because people are looking at the fact that we've got a record seven million people on an NHS waiting list. In England, I think a lot of people feel very browbeaten about what happened during the pandemic. And, and I, I am keen to get your views on this because you mentioned a point there, and this kind of is really central to this discussion, really, which is, was what happened during the pandemic, i.e., you know, the, the, the amazing work that nurses did and the pressure that they were under and all of that stuff, how much do they deserve financially in terms of well, compensation or remuneration, I suppose, as a result of that. Because increasingly now, as the knock-on effects of our lockdown are working their way through, a lot of people are saying, well, I had to shut my business down. I couldn't see my loved ones. Uh, I'm in financial ruin as a result of this. And people are saying, well, they did that to protect the NHS. Yes, we went out and clapped for them a lot of the time. But actually, have we not already paid the price to make sure the NHS wasn't overwhelmed? Well, if we have, it's not working, is it? As I said, you know, I hope you'll get some union officials on to talk about we are this because they will give you, <laughs> yeah, well, they'll they'll give you chapter and verse about what's happening in the NHS. You know, record numbers of people leaving, record numbers off with stress. Um, yes, there is some recruitment going on, but it's not enough to replace all the people who are leaving. You know, if everything was fine, if we paid them back. Why is this happening? Why are midwives and physiotherapists now voting on to go on strike? You know, there's something wrong. There's something fundamentally wrong here with the funding, I think, uh, of the NHS. And I get back to my uh, point. Or potentially you, the structure you know. of it as well, or, or potentially yeah. the structure of it. This is another thing that we're going to get stuck into as well a bit later on in the show, which is the, the, the management scale of it all as well. Where's that money going? What are we paying agency staff? A lot of people are pointing out that maybe there could be big savings made. And I suppose it does come in line with... How much of our national budget do we sacrifice towards the NHS? Do we mostly now pay our tax to support our NHS? We have got some whopping great big questions to answer on this show. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very, very much. Great to have you on the show. Yeah. Alan Jones there, industrial correspondent for the Press Association, reacting to this nurse's strike. So, yes, if you are just joining us, nurses have voted to strike. That strike is likely to take place in the run-up to Christmas, so maximum damage, some would say. It is fundamentally overpay, and that pay that rise that they want is, roughly speaking, 17.6%. A lot of angry people out there, considering we've got a massive backlog on the waiting list. A lot of people saying that they think it's actually wrong morally for nurses to go on strike. But you cannot get around the idea that, clearly, if you just went out on the street now and you stopped most people and you didn't give them much time to think about it, they would say, well, yeah, 
of course, nurses deserve a pay rise. Your views, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Coming up, as Lord Frost tells GB News in an exclusive interview, he believes that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is a hypocrite for importing US fracked gas whilst not allowing it in the UK. Yet another example that we're just giving in to eco-madness. It makes no sense. I'm telling you, it's just a financial boys' club, this COP27 stuff. I'm asking, is it time to bring back fracking in this country? I'll be back in a moment. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Welcome back, everybody. It's electric today, right here with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. We've had nurses' strikes, we've got massive issues with the police, but we've got another issue right now as well, because Rishi Sunak is reportedly on the brink of a major deal with Joe Biden, good grief, which could bring fracked gas from the US to avoid blackouts this winter. If only there was another solution, ladies and gentlemen. If only it was staring us right in the face. If only we were sitting right on top of it. It sparked controversy, as some people claim it would make the UK more reliant on gas produced by fracking just weeks after Rishi Sunak reimposed a ban on the technology here in the UK. It's madness. It's utter madness. During an exclusive interview with Lord Frost, Liam Halligan asked what he made of it. I'm personally in favour of at least trying fracking and seeing if we can if we can do that. And I think there's a degree of hypocrisy in those who say who won't do fracking in the UK but are perfectly happy to import large quantities of fracked gas from the US or Qatar or or you know wherever else. I think it's um, it is just uh, a bit um, kind of unreasonable to look at it in that way. We should be responsible for our own security of supply as far as we possibly can. Yes, well, joining me now to discuss this is policy manager at UK Onshore Oil and Gas. It's Charles McAllister. And we've got the environmental consultant, Anthony Day, as well. Charles, I'll start with you. It doesn't seem to make much sense to me to ban fracking in this country and then import fracked gas from the United States. I mean, especially when we just hear that we've got a nurses' strike in this in this country, maybe maybe the frack gas could help pay for a, for nurses' wage increases. Absolutely, it is textbook naked hypocrisy 
from the government. I mean, we're seeing a deal for about 10 billion cubic metres, apparently. We don't know over what time or for how much money. Meanwhile, we're sitting on potentially 500 years' worth of gas in the ground. Imports do not offer the evident economic, environmental and geopolitical benefits a domestic shale gas industry would offer. I've just been listening to your show and I've heard about the country is literally running out of money. Mm. Imports, when imported oil and gas offers zero in tax. With domestic shale gas production, we can boost our tax revenue and fund some of these things. Anthony Day, environmental consultant, I can't help but wonder whether or not we're entering referendum territory, that R word on this, because if the country really is this skint and everyone's going on strike over it, maybe we deserve a vote on whether or not we should be farming some of the money out of this. Well, maybe. But just to pick up on your earlier point, your introduction, you're talking about importing gas from the United States to see us over the winter. Mm. Well, there's no way we'd ever get fracking up and running to sort out this winter. I get and that, but in so future... So we are though. where we are. They have gas, we haven't. So that's oh, the first on. practical point. Well, can I just jump in there very quickly? There's no technology, no new infrastructure can solve the 2022-2023 crisis. It is a legacy issue. You see, in terms of delivering the maximum amount of energy with the least amount of land in the least amount of time, fracking is the best technology right. in the UK, no question. Oh, Anthony, sorry, carry, carry on, Anthony. Uh, well, just picking up that point, uh, the thing is that we have to transition from gas if we are to meet uh, net zero 2050, which is what the Prime Minister is committed to. So therefore, I don't think he's being hypocritical at all, because if we've got to get rid of gas, there's no point in starting up uh, domestic gas production, because by the time it comes on stream, it's the time when we've got to be uh, phasing it down. That's wrong. Go on. Yeah, that's, well, look at between now and 2050, the shortfall, the gap between how much we're going to consume and how much we're going to produce from the North Sea in the central scenario is a trillion cubic metres, OK? At rock bottom gas prices, that's about £200 billion. High prices, so 290 pence per therm, we're looking at easily a trillion. So the idea that we're not going to need it or we're not going to import it is wrong. We can, get, we can make the UK self-sufficient in natural gas using shale gas on top of increased North Sea production by the 2030s. That is something we absolutely should be doing. See if we lock ourselves into reliance on import. I mean, look at this LNG deal, for example. Liquefied natural gas at the point of delivery is four times as carbon intensive as producing it domestically. That makes no sense. Uh, Anthony, you've got to come back on that. Well, you're, you're very certain that we've got, what, 500 years or enormous amounts of, of shale gas uh, beneath the, the surface of the ground in the UK. But if you look at the um, British Geological Survey, there is actually no certainty. There's not been sufficient uh, exploratory drilling to actually prove that it's there. Although it's the same sort of, of rock, whether in fact it is actually bearing uh, gas or whether it's been broken up and so on, we just don't know. And the so, other so, thing is, if you take okay. qu Quadrilla's figures, mm -hmm. if you take Quadrilla's figures and you seek to replace all gas from uh, shale, you're going to have to dwill, drill 12,500 wells. Nonsense. Now, we ain't got room for that. That's, okay. that's a total nonsense. Look at the quadrilla, look at the report that well, we put out. To cut, to cut our gas land figures. in half. No, it's not, because I, the quadrilla figures are in the report that I wrote that are part of our trade association, OK? To make the UK self-sufficient by the, by the 2030s, we need 4,000 wells. To cut our gas demand in half over that period of time, we need about 2,000. And again, you see, a shale gas site is about two hectares in size. Uh, it's about the size of a football pitch. To produce the same amount of energy from an onshore wind farm, you need a land area 725 times the size. The simple facts are we're going to need gas. It's better to produce it domestically. Increasing reliance on imports, which this deal seems to do, makes absolutely no economic, environmental or geopolitical sense. Yeah, uh, Anthony, I mean, look, a lot of people right now are saying, well, hang on a minute, a lot of the real life data doesn't appear to be getting out of there. For example, when you look at the way that the UK or Britain has managed to cut CO2 emissions since 2010, we are, we are leading when it comes to the G7 nations, other G7 nations. We've, we've halved it since 2010, but you don't really hear about that from the likes of people who like to glue themselves to bridges, do they? Aren't we doing enough? Haven't we now got to look after our own? Why are we lining Americans' pockets or Putin's pockets when we should be lining our own? Well, hang on. First of all, the statistics that you just quoted. Yeah, that's fine if you that's don't good. include...
what we've offshored. Yes, I know, but the point is that we're manufacturing far less, so therefore the emissions that come from manufacturing are actually coming from the Chinese or the other countries who are not going to stop manufacturing the things that we're buying. I, I, you know? I, I totally, so I totally agree with on that. On a global scale, it, it's 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 not reduced that much, and also the, those figures you're quoting, I think, exclude international aviation and shipping, which are quite significant. Well, then this is a key point, Anthony. I'd, I'd really be really intrigued to get your take on this because this is a, a dilemma, isn't it? If China has emitted more noxious gases in the last eight years than we have than we have since the start of our industrial revolution, and China are not going to stop doing that, then actually, what, what, why should we be the ones to pay the price for all of this? Shouldn't we just crack on, or frack on, as some would say? Why should we have a free ride? We have a problem. Emissions are our problem. If you watched COP27, if you saw what the Secretary General of the United Nations said, we are in a dangerous situation, and we have got to mm. phase out fossil fuels as fast as we possibly can. And therefore, building or drilling extra supplies okay. in this country is folly. Very quickly and very finely, Charles. I don't see how continued over-reliance on a more expensive, more carbon-intensive form of natural gas helps us meet our net zero targets. That's what you call a debate. Good stuff, chaps. Thank you very, very much. Really, really enjoyed that. A lot for, for people to take on board there. Policy Manager at UK Onshore Oil and Gas, Charles McAllister, join me in the studio and the environmental consultant, Anthony Day, down the line. Good grief. Where's this hour gone, ladies and gentlemen? We've had it all, haven't we? You are with me, Patrick Christie's right here on GB News. The big one today is nurses will go on strike right in the run-up to Christmas. Your take on that. We're going to be putting your views to various different medical professionals, some in favour, some against, including, as we understand, Standard former Health Minister Alan Johnson as well will be very keen to get his take on all of this. We're also talking about the policing crisis and much, much more. Oh, yes, and of course, a little bit about migrant hotels in your area. When will the madness end? Patrick Christie's right here on GB News. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget, the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. PM. This is me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Now, this hour, more on that developing, breaking story that nurses have voted to go on strike. The first time in more than 100 years. We kicked the living daylights out of this story on Monday. Why? Because we knew it was around the corner. It was all too predictable, and we got that confirmation just moments before I walked through the door to come on air to speak to you wonderful people that nurses will walk out in the run-up to Christmas. It's going to happen across the UK, and it's primarily over pay, with action expected to start, like I've said, in that busy window, the period, arguably, when most people need the NHS. It will involve Royal College of Nursing members 
in more than half of hospitals and community teams, but emergency care will still be staffed. However, if you look down that list of things that are going to be affected, it includes chemo, it includes dialysis, frankly, people are going to get ill and people may well die. Do you have some sympathy for them, though? It's Now it's been announced, much more of a mixed bag in the inbox than it was on Monday. A lot of people are saying, no, this is disgraceful, people will die, we can't have it. Nurses are paid enough. Some people are saying, just give them what they want. They want around a 17.6% pay rise. How do you feel, do you think, that if nurses strike, they may well have blood on their hands? I'll ask two workers, two health workers, if they back their strike actions. Also, Swella Braverman has called on officers not to get distracted by politically correct issues. She doesn't want wokeism to infiltrate our police force. She made the call and claimed that there's no such thing as petty crime as she addressed police chiefs. Big one on this one is that she wants to get police officers, the police and crime commissioners want it, out of the classrooms and onto the streets, saying you don't really need a top tier degree in order to be a Bobby on the beat. How do you think about that? Do you think we will get tougher on crime? Is it all hot air? And get this, people, we await a decision on whether a hotel in East Yorkshire will be used to house asylum seekers. If you're not from East Yorkshire and you don't give a toss, well, you should, because it's going to happen in a place near you. And could this set a legal precedent now? Could it set a legal precedent that could stop migrant hotels popping up in your area. GB views at gbnews.uk. Loads to get stuck into there. How do you feel about the nursing strike? I want to put your views to medical professionals who are both for and against it. How do you feel about the potential for a legal precedent to stop a migrant hotel popping up in your town? Now it's the news. Patrick, thank you. As you've been hearing, the Royal College of Nursing has announced its first national strike action in its 106-year history. The RCN says the strike will affect the majority of NHS employers in the UK as nurses take action against pay levels and patient safety concerns. The union's 300,000 members were urged to vote for industrial action. Emergency care will not be affected. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, has described the decision to strike as disappointing. The Prime Minister insists he didn't know about specific concerns over Sir Gavin Williamson when he appointed him to his Cabinet. The MP left his post last night, saying allegations of bullying and his conduct are becoming a distraction to the good work of the government. Sir Gavin denies any wrongdoing. Speaking at PMQ's, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer criticised Sir Gavin and questioned Rishi Sunak's judgement in appointing him in the first place. The proof is simple. He's a pathetic bully. But he would never get away with it if people like the Prime Minister didn't hand him power. So does he regret his decision to make him a government minister? Mr Speaker, I obviously regret appointing someone who has had to resign in these circumstances. But I think, but I think what the British people would like to know is that when situations like this arise, that they will be dealt with properly. And that's why, and that's why it is absolutely right that he resigned. Meanwhile, the Home Secretary is urging police chiefs to focus on what she's calling common sense, not politically correct, distractions. Speaking at a conference in Westminster, Suella Braverman said the public expects the police to be tackling crime, not debating gender on Twitter. Ms Braverman also urged the force to reconsider police action that could be seen as woke. I've asked my officials to revisit the issue of non-crime hate incidents as a first step as I want to be sure that we are allowing you to prioritise your time and your energy to deal with the threats to people and their property. A 23-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of a public order offence after throwing eggs at King Charles and the Queen Consort in York. The incident happened as they arrived at York Minster to unveil a statue of the late Queen. It's understood a protester threw three eggs at them, all of which missed before the royal couple um, on the floor before the royal couple. Several police officers at Micklegate Bar were seen restraining a suspect on the ground immediately after the incident. 
NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg has visited Downing Street to meet with the Prime Minister. He's the first international leader to visit since Rishi Sunak entered number 10. Mr Sunak described NATO as a cornerstone of UK security and Mr Stoltenberg thanked Mr Sunak for the UK's strong support of NATO. Two people have been arrested and a police officer has been injured after responding to a climate protest on the M25 this morning. Essex police said there was a collision between a motorbike and two lorries in a rolling roadblock that had been imposed because of an activist on the motorway. This is the third day of action on the UK's busiest motorway. Just Stop Oil say around 10 of its supporters climbed onto overhead gantries in multiple locations on the M25 this morning. The Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, told GB News protesters are causing mass disruption. We have COP27 going on. If you are serious and want to be constructive about climate change, about making those changes, then if you are serious about that, you should be going to COP27. You should be constructively engaging with that dialogue, um, not sticking yourself to parts of the M25. And in the United States, results for the midterms are being declared today, with some states still too close to call. If the Democrats lose either the House or the Senate, that enables the Republicans to limit President Joe Biden's ability to pass laws. Results out so far show Republicans are on course to gain control of the House of Representatives. The race for the Senate is on a knife edge. It could be days before the final results are announced due to the high number of postal votes. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is expected to announce whether or not he'll run again to be president. Former White House senior adviser Amarosa Mangigo says Mr Trump is surprised by the initial overnight results. You with GB News, more news as that happens. Now back to Patrick. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. I tell you what, it's kicked right off politically and indeed domestically, even just in the last few moments over this nurses' strike. That's the big breaking news of the day, that nurses have voted to go on strike and they will indeed be striking, as we understand it, in the run-up to Christmas. Now, the Health Secretary, Steve Baker, has said that it's disappointing that nurses have voted to go on strike. He warned the action would lead to patients facing delays to care and he stopped sort of saying it, but I won't, deaths. Now... Really fascinating. It's just going to give you a couple of little facts and figs because he is saying that they've had a pay rise of 1,400 quid this year on top of a 3% pay rise the year before. What they want now is 17.6%, so inflation plus 5%, basically. Otherwise, they're going to withdraw their labour. They're also talking about the fact that there is a recruitment and a retention crisis. Steve Baker at pains to say that the Tories have promised 50, 50, 000 nurses by 2024. They've already de delivered, according to him, 30,000. What do you make of this? There is a massive morality element to this, isn't there? And I think that's kind of where I'm at on this, which is that, realistically, if a nurse goes on strike and someone dies, is that worth it? Does that patient really need to see the bigger picture. GB views at gbnews.uk. Do you think they're already paid enough? Plenty of you saying, actually, hang on a minute, maybe we should give them a pay rise, just potentially not quite what they actually want. There's a lot of money going about here. Just over an hour ago, the Royal College of Nursing announced that nurses will walk out by the end of the year in a row over pay. It's going to be the first proper nurses' strike for around 130 years. I mean, it's major stuff, this, people. It's going to be in the lead-up, of course, to the ballot results. The government said it had contingency plans for dealing with any industrial action by nurses. Shadow Health Secretary, and this is kind of where it's kicked off, really, West Streeting accused the government of unacceptable Negligence. A little bit rich when you look at some of the negligence claims that are going through the NHS right now. But our political reporter, Olivia Utley, is in Westminster. Olivia, this row is not going away. People now, patients, ordinary people, staring down the barrel of a run-up to Christmas without an ability to get routine health care. Yes, and it's hard to overestimate the scale of this walkout. The Royal College of Nursing is recommending that its 300,000 members walk out over this run-up to Christmas period. And remember, of course, that this is against a backdrop of the longest waiting list in NHS history. There are currently 7 million people awaiting uh, appointments for routine checks, for operations even, many of them who've been in pain for months, if not years. So there's quite a lot of 
absolute pressure on nurses to back down. Of course, the other element is we've got the fiscal statement coming out next week. The NHS is asking for another £7 billion of funding, but the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, given the economic situation, are obviously going to have to make massive swathes of cuts across the rest of the public sector. So you're going to have a lot of angry people in the education sector, the defence sector, uh, the pension sector, for example. If all this money just goes into the NHS and the cuts made in their departments are so deep it becomes sort of impossible to maintain any level of normal service. Those who are defending the nurses, of course, make the point that they were massively overworked during the coronavirus pandemic and made that pandemic a lot better than it might otherwise have been. The other issue, which I think was raised in the bulletin there, is that there is a problem with recruitment and retention among nurses, which does suggest that pay is too low, even though the pay rise has been, as you say, this year, £1,400. Um, so... <laughs> Both sides have good arguments, and it's very hard to see either of them backing down any time soon. Yeah, 100%. And actually, our own economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, called this not long after Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, saying that he's going to have to stare down several different strikes. I suspect this is just going to be... Well, it's not the first, is it? We've already had the rail strikes. In fact, I was caught up in one of those quite recently. Anyway, Olivia, thank you very much. Olivia Rutley there, our political reporter in Westminster. If you're just joining us, that is the big news of the day. Nurses strike. We're a bit ahead of the curve on this because I was calling on Monday. I was banging on the door saying this is just around the corner. And now, here we are. I just want to give you some figures because I'm going to speak to uh, an individual on this right now. But do you know that our... This is according to the official stats, which is that the percentage of GDP that we spend in the United Kingdom on the NHS in 2021 was 11.9%. 2020, so during the pandemic, was 12%. So basically, it's around 12%. So 12% of our GDP as a nation, we already spend apparently on healthcare, on healthcare. Uh, and that equates to roughly £216.8 billion a year. Now, that budget is only ever going to go up, one would imagine. So there we go. The current average salary of a nurse, this again is actually according to the Royal College of Nursing, before people jump all over me in the inbox, is around £33,500. The average salary, that can go up, but of course student nurses are on less. A £1,400 pay rise already this year, a 3% pay rise the year before. Nurses now want, the Royal College of Nursing now wants a 17.6% percent pay rise. This strike action confirmed, unless something drastic changes, will, as we understand it, take place in the run-up to Christmas. I am joined by Dr Shirin Lakani, who's a private uh, intimate health specialist and a psychiatric nurse, Julia Taylor, as well, who voted against the strike. I believe they're both there, but there we go. Uh, anyway, I'll start with Shirin. Thank you very much, Shirin. Um, OK, so, look, where are you on this, then? Just talk to me, first and foremost, about whether or not you back this nurse's strike and why. Um, first of all, I'd like to say for any medical professional to want to take strike action means that the situation is absolutely dire and drastic. Nobody goes into the medical profession, whether it's a doctor or being a nurse, with money at the forefront. They go into care for patients. And the fact that it's got to this stage, um, yes, the nurses want a pay rise, but their primary reason is because patient care is suffering. Well, there aren't enough nurses. Sorry, can I, can I just ask you on that? Can I just ask you on that one then? So as far as you're saying now that the primary reason is that that patient care is suffering, I can't help but wonder whether that's an, a rather convenient sidestep, really, because the main issue is pay. The main issue is that they want a 17.6% uh, pay rate. If retention, if you look at staffing motors, um, they are completely understaffed. Their health service is under immense pressure. So if you want to get good nurses in, if you want to keep good nurses in, and you want to keep the health service going, it is going to come down to paying a living wage at the end it of the day. It is about pay. It's not just about pay. You can't right. have a health service functioning on minimal staff that where you don't have enough nurse-patient ratio to provide self safe, um, safe health care. OK, so all right, Julie... I, OK, I, I, I get that. I'll come back to you. Julia Taylor joins me now. Now, Julia, I spoke to you, I think it was on Monday. Gosh, it feels like a lifetime ago. Now, my understanding is that you, as a psychiatric nurse, now you are not in favour of this strike. How do you feel now it, it's official there will be strike action, as we understand it, in the run-up to Christmas? 
I'm not shocked, to be fair. Um, it, it's not a shock at all because what that doctor is saying is actually right, that, that we aren't attracting nurses to the profession because why would they want to come and work as a nurse when the pay is terrible? But at the same time, there's always another option. Go and join an agency. If you want more money, go and join an agency. And what you're finding now is there's agency staff going into the hospitals. They're doing the same nurse, the same job as the other nurse and getting paid double. So it, mm. it's, I worry, and I mean this, Patrick, I worry that the government have done this on purpose to so that end up going private. That's what I actually think. Well, well, uh, and to be fair, the flip side of that is the, the private model is looking increasingly attractive to a lot of people because when you look at the things that we've got, uh, 7 million people in England alone apparently on a waiting list for treatment, and then you look at the strikes, etc., people are starting to wonder whether or not privatisation is an option. I'm just going to stick with you, Julia, just quickly, because I'm keen to know why you personally didn't want to strike, because I think it's... Is it the moral argument for you? Is it that idea that when you decided not to go to work someone, well, a patient, would suffer? Uh -huh. Right, I see four patients every day and I'm, I'm already working on a little backlog from the COVID pandemic and I'm, get, I'm cracking through that as fast as I can. If I was to go on strike for one day, that's four patients that would end up being seen later than they should. And I wonder how many days strike because there's no way the government are going to give in by nurse strike and they just won't do it. Mm. They'd rather employ people from abroad to take our places. That's what they'll do. Mm. OK, Sh Shirin, can I just talk to you? I mean, I think Julie's, Julie's, Julie's made some great points there, Shirin, and I do take on board exactly what you, you said to me to me earlier on. Look, I've just got to put this side of it up, OK, and get your response from it, which is that the nation itself is struggling. We've got people in a whole raft of different capacities in the public and the private sector who are skint at the minute, small businesses on their knees, and we did lock down to protect the NHS and people did suffer as a result of that financially. Just some people, I'm not saying this is my view, some people are saying, right now, this country is in an hour of need, a dark hour. And in that hour of need, are nurses voting to leave us hanging high and dry? I think you'll find that nurses and healthcare professionals in general put the public ahead of themselves and ahead of the families. And we saw that during the pandemic as well. There was immense personal sacrifice from the healthcare professionals to keep the health service going. So one minute there are heroes, the next minute they're being demonised. And I would have to quite strongly say that you don't go into medicine primarily for pay. The pay has become part of it because the conditions are so poor that the staffing levels are not safe. So you need to attract new staffing. And where the other nurse mentioned um, bank staff and agency, Nurses are having to mm. go and do bank work because they are not being paid properly, but the NHS is still paying more than if they would have paid the nurses properly in the first place. Can, can I ask, un, unless I'm reading your job title incorrectly, it says, it says here anyway, private intimate health specialist. Does that mean you work in, in private medicine, so you're yeah, not work in the in NHS? Private medicine. No, I don't work in the NHS anymore. So, so I think that's relevant, isn't it, really, given this? Why, why is that? Because clearly you preferred the private system, why shouldn't the nation? In terms... So, are you saying that we should privatise the whole NHS? I, I don't know. I'm not really saying that. I'm just asking oh, why well, you decided... No, that I'm just trying to get your question, because I work... Oh, well, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what... I'll tell you where I, I'll come at it from, which is that yeah. I think the idea of the NHS is absolutely lovely and wonderful, and the people who work in it, by and large, do a tremendous job. But I look at it now, and it isn't functioning. Nurses aren't happy. I dare say a lot of doctors aren't happy. A lot of patients aren't happy. We've got a massive backlog. And to be honest with you, I'm looking at it and thinking, well, maybe we do need to privatise the thing because what we've got now I isn't working. Are we flogging a dead horse? Privatisation's the way to go, though, because at the end of the day, again, it'll be the patients who can't afford private care that are going to end up suffering. Mm. So we need to find a way to improve the way we spend money in the NHS and optimise the spending so that we get the best out of it, rather than just say, oh, let's just jack it in.
OK, no, that's interesting. Julie, can I just give the final word to you on this? Because I have a lot of people who get in touch and go, OK, well, maybe we need to restructure it a bit. Is there, is there a bloated management system? Is there a way that we can restructure the, the billions, the hundreds of billions that we already spend annually on our NHS? Can that be divvied out differently so that nurses like yourself can get better pay and be happy and not go on strike? More than likely, yes, if you look at the figures. A good waste for now, 40, 423 million agency, that's how much money was spent in the last year on the NHS on mm. agency. That itself would pay for the for the nurses' wage rise. But okay. why, why don't they do that? The government, can I be honest here? Yeah. The only way we're going to get any kind of decent pay rise or even a a decent life as a nurse and have the NHS working properly how it should is to get the Tory government out. That's your view. And that's a sad thing for me to say, because I usually vote for Tory. That's interesting um, stuff. Well, look, uh, look, well, 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 I suppose, yeah, I mean, I suppose, the, I suppose the flip side of that might be, well, then, I suppose, is Labour going to be in the pocket of the unions and where does that end? I don't mean Labour. Good God, oh. no. Oh. Tom, I can't tell me what, what I am. I'm a woman and he can't even tell me that. How are we supposed to keep statistics on people? I'll, I could go on and on about that, Patrick. I, I don't think this is going to be the last time I talk to you, Julia. Thank you very much. And look, both of you, I, I've really enjoyed that. There's so many different elements to this. It's like an onion when it comes to the nurses' strike and the NHS as a whole. And it's really enlightening. Shimon Lakani there, who's a private intimate health specialist and psychiatric nurse, Julia Taylor, who did not back the strike. So there we go. A range of views. Thank you very much, both of you. Lovely stuff. Right. Oh, grief, yes, that breaking news. Nurses' strike is going to go ahead. It's going to happen in the run-up to Christmas. Lots of your thoughts. Email in, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Helen, sorry. No sympathy for striking nurses, says Helen. Holding patients to ransom is never a good luck. Interesting one, that, though, Helen, isn't it? Because, look, broadly, I agree with you. Absolutely. I think that's pretty clear. But when people are lying in their hospital bed or they've got a relative there... Do they end up realistically blaming the nurses or do they blame whoever's in charge at the time? And I can't help but feel as though the Royal College of Nursing has got the government over a bit of a barrel here. Steve Barkley, or Steve Baker, I should say, actually. Uh, Steve Barkley, no, in fact, gosh, I'll get it right eventually, is saying that he doesn't think that this is actually the right thing to do. He's saying they have tried to negotiate, of course, with uh, nurses and they've had you know, pay rises, etc. Ken's been in touch. He says, in the health service, there are a few doing a lot and a lot doing very little. I'm fed up of waiting to be seen whilst watching and listening to groups of nurses and staff talking about their holidays and generally not working. That's his view. Peter says, nurses must get their 17% pay rise. They are essential to British health. Fair enough, Peter. All I would say is, where does this end? Because I've had another couple of emails in on this one and I think this is almost like the counterpoint to that. And I'm just going to read it to you now. Uh, Steve put this in touch, Peter. He says, there are literally millions of people who earn way less than nurses, right? He goes, it's an important job, but so is getting the bins emptied, sewers cleaned and roads swept. He says that these jobs pay loads less than nursing, but are just as needed and people don't respect the guys who, does the, who do them know to striking. So I suppose, Peter, this is the kind of argument, isn't it? If... The nurses go on strike in the run-up to Christmas, demanding a 17.6% pay rise. Well, then where does that end? Do teachers just do mass walkouts just until they get exactly what they want? Does the rail workers get until they get exactly what they want? Where does all of that end? Does anyone who works in the public sector have a look at this now and go, oh, hang on a minute, I suppose the ace in the nurses' deck, as it were, or their union's deck, is the fact that if they go on strike, then essentially people will die and treatment will suffer in the run-up to Christmas. Fascinating stuff. You are with me, Patrick Christie's. This is GB News. What's also worth noting is that Labour are yet to come out and back the strike. So there we go. That's going to be one. We are hopefully going to speak to somebody from the Labour Party at some point soon to see whether or not they support these strikes. The Home Secretary, though, moving on. Suella Bravman has addressed police chiefs this afternoon as she's called on a crackdown on crime and claimed there's no such thing as petty crime. Her rallying calls come as police and crime commissioners call on her to speed up the process of getting bobbies on the beat rather than in the classroom. We're going to discuss that next. No to woke policing and do you need more bobbies on the beat? Do you care, realistically, if the person who comes around to investigate your nan's house being burgled has got a degree? I'll be back in a moment.
My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 pm on GB News. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online, across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Now, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is facing calls from a number of police and crime commissioners across the country to get new officer recruits out of the classroom and onto the beat. It's law and order stuff there, so it's another little bit of breaking for you, because they say that regulations requiring new recruits to undertake three years of study is likely to endanger the government's flagship 20,000 police uplift programme. In case you've been living on the moon with your fingers on your ears, basically, to be fair, the Tories did cut 20,000 police officers and now they're desperately trying to recruit... 20,000 police officers, so there we go. The letter sent to her by police and crime commissioners comes as she addressed them face-to-face -face at a conference within the last hour. Home Sec Braverman addressed police chiefs. This is what she had to say. We've recruited more than 50,000 additional officers, so we are well on the way to 20,000. I've met some of these new officers, and it's great to see their enthusiasm uh, for their new careers, some not far from here, in the safer neighbourhood team within the Met. The College of Policing has been working hard to raise the standards of initial entry and ensure that officers are equipped to meet the challenges of policing today. And we know that to build public confidence, we must draw from the widest pool of talent across all sections of society. OK, there we go. That was Suella Braverman there. Now, this is an issue... Oh, we're hitting all the key issues today right here, aren't we, on GB News, because we've got that breaking nurses strike, and now we've got another issue that's massively close to your heart, which is law and order, specifically the breakdown of, and why this is happening. Could this be a solution to get more bobbies on the beat? Do you really care if the person who comes around to investigate a burglary or a murder or a stabbing has got a degree? I mean, goodness only knows why some of those people would need a degree. Can't we do more in-house training, get them out on the beat quick enough? The only degree they need is potentially one in common sense. But I'm joined now by someone who was at that summit, up close and personal with Suella Braverman, Ellie Vasey thompson who is the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for Surrey. Right. So, lots to get stuck into here. Why on earth does a police officer really need a degree? Can't we just be fast-tracking them through? Can't you all just train them yourselves and get them out there? What a question. Um, thanks for having me. Firstly, I just want to reassure viewers that police officers aren't spending the entire first three years in the classroom. It's about 10% of that time over, over three years. But you're right. And one of the reasons that myself and, and many police and crime commissioners around the country really welcome what Suella has said today is that we need police officers from all walks of life. And the, the, the degree requirement really puts off some people from applying because they might be at a stage in their life where they just don't have the time to dedicate to studying for a degree alongside the job and the training that's involved in that aspect. 
OK, that's interesting. What kind of recruits are you getting? I have heard some absolute shocking stories, OK? Now, yeah, all right, you only hear the bad stuff, but some of it is awful. Someone had a therapy slug that they had to keep with them at all times, a recruit, that was like a comfort animal. I'm not joking. Someone used to get dropped off every day by their mum and dad who called into one of the... Obviously, so they didn't think their son was being treated particularly nice. What kind of recruits are we getting in the police at the minute? As you said, you, you hear the bad stories. I mean, I, I've, I've heard a few myself, and I think a lot of it is speculation. I don't find slugs particularly therapeutic myself, so I, I'm no. going to avoid the therapy slug. Um, but, but we are getting decent recruits. We're getting really good people through the door. The problem is we're just not getting the diversity. And to, so, for example, I lead our office on, uh, on veterans, military and veterans, and, and we're not getting the ex-forces recruits that we used to because people don't want to leave the military and then spend three years uh, studying a degree. So, so that's one of the problems. And again, that's why we welcome what the Home Secretary's announced today. It's almost like we planned this because you're taking the words out of my mouth. Everyone's screaming at me here in the inbox, veterans, veterans, veterans. And this is a fantastic thing to do. It kills two birds with one stone, for want of a better phrase, because a lot of veterans struggle anyway when they come out of the military. This would be a good way of putting them to good use. Also, one would imagine they'd be incredibly qualified and they won't take any utter, utter nonsense or be, a, be scared when someone, you know, on the streets of Camden pulls out a knife or whatever. So, why aren't we just really going after to the veterans community and getting them on board. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm someone with a degree. You wouldn't want me going into a, a bar crawl, but you'd, you'd absolutely want an ex-forces person going in to break up that fight. Um, it's actually something that in Surrey we've already been um, looking at uh, as options for, for ex-forces. So I'm, I'm really pleased that this sort of takes away the barrier. And actually what the Home Secretary said today about cutting the red tape to make sure that this, this route does become available is really important because a lot of it is red tape. Um, but yeah, as you say, it kills, kills two birds with one stone, for want of a better phrase. Um, we've got some excellent forces, um, officers, ex-forces officers in, in Surrey and across the country already. Um, but I've spoken to many of them since the degree requirement came in and a lot of them know former colleagues from the forces who are put off from joining. Yeah, 100%. People don't really care about red tape. What they really want to make sure is that they feel safe on the streets, that they, their daughters or their sons or whatever can walk home from school or from a night out and not feel threatened, and that if something does happen in that terrible situation, they're going to get a quick and speedy response from the police. The best that can be done to fast-track that approach, in my view, is, well, frankly, the best option. Ellie, thank you very much. Ellie Vesey thompson there, the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner for Surrey. Just on that issue, apparently less, less bobbies in the classroom, more boys on the beat. A couple of people getting in touch actually saying, when was the last time we actually saw a bobby on the beat? Bit skewed for me, I am now based down in London. But I take your point, I don't remember when I went back home to see my, my family up uh, the last weekend. I, honestly, I, I don't remember the last time I saw a bobby on the beat in my local hometown, but there we go. Coming up, we await a decision on whether or not a hotel in East Yorkshire can be used for asylum seekers. I'm asking, if not hotels, where do we put them? Also, if you think, well, I don't live in East Yorkshire, so it's not, not my bag, it is your bag, because I guarantee you, if you've not already, you're about to get a migrant hotel in your town. This lot at the council there, East Riding, have decided to take legal action against it. Could it set a legal precedent? Would you want your council to do it? And there is that big question. If we don't put them in hotels then, where do we put some of these people? I've been saying it for a while, it's tent cities in your local park. First, it's headlines. Patrick, thank you and good afternoon to you. Our top stories today from GB News. The Royal College of Nursing has announced the first national strike in its 106-year history. The RCN says the action will affect the majority of NHS employers in the UK as nurses walk out over pay and patient safety concerns. The union's 300,000 members were urged to vote in favour of industrial action, but it's understood emergency care won't be affected. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, has described the decision as disappointing. The key issue is one of fairness. Uh, we've offered £1,400. We've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body. We gave an increase last year above what most of the public sector workers received. Uh, and we also need to recognise the economic circumstances in which we currently face. The Prime Minister insists he didn't know about specific concerns over Sir Gavin Williamson when he appointed him to the Cabinet. The MP left his post last night saying allegations of bullying are becoming a distraction to the good work of the government, adding he denied any wrongdoing. 
The Home Secretary is urging police chiefs to focus on wit what she calls common sense policing and not politically correct distractions. Speaking at a conference in Westminster, Suella Bravman said the public expects the police to be tackling crime, not debating topics such as gender on Twitter. She also urged the force to reconsider police action that could be seen as woke. And a 23-year-old man has been arrested after throwing eggs at King Charles and the Queen Consort in York. It's understood three eggs were thrown in total, all of which missed the royal couple. Several police officers at Micklegate Bar were seen restraining a suspect on the ground immediately after the incident. You're up to date on TV online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Don't go anywhere. Patrick's back in just a moment. OK, ladies and gentlemen, you might have to just bear with me on this one now because it's coming through to me right as we speak here. It's some more breaking news and it's relating to the war in Ukraine. Russia has abandoned the key Ukrainian city of Kurzon in a major retreat. So, yes, Russian Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu ordered his troops to withdraw from the west bank of the Dnipro River in the face of Ukrainian attacks near there. It's a significant retreat and political turning point in the war, gosh, uh, Kiev's forces have made significant advances in recent weeks through the Kurzon province. And they are using that as obviously the gateway to the Crimea Peninsula that Russia annexed in 2014. If you remember all the way back in February, Kurzon was the first major Ukrainian city to fall when Vladimir Putin's forces invaded. So if you're just joining us there, yes, that's quite big breaking news, really, which is that Russia has now abandoned key Ukrainian cities. Let's just discuss this with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey who is in Westminster for us, I believe. Darren, yeah, sorry, that just came through in my ear pretty much literally as I went back live. So uh, educate me in the nation, please. Yeah, really fascinating this. As you say, there has been a counter-offensive by the Ukrainians over the last couple of weeks and months in the Curzon uh, region. It is uh, symbolically and very, very significant, uh, this. Curzon, as you rightly pointed out, was the first proper Ru uh, Ukrainian city captured by the Russians. The very fact that they've not been able to hold on to it will be a very, very damaging blow for President Putin. It was announced live on Russian television, this effective withdrawal uh, this afternoon. It's quite humiliating, let's be honest, about this for uh, the Russians. Now, the reason they've done so is even though the counteroffensive from the Ukrainians has somewhat slowed in the last couple of weeks as we get into the depths of autumn and into uh, winter. The Russians simply could not keep the supply lines to the troops in that city going and that is why they decided to essentially cut and run, if you like. Now, what this means is that the Russians are nowhere west now of the Dnipro River in that part of, of the country. Uh, far from advancing in Ukraine, eight, nine months into this war, they are simply retreating, whether it is in the east or indeed in the south. And this will be a strategic blow, but also, as I say, a humiliating one uh, for Moscow. And it is a reminder, I think, I suppose, that in the efforts and the efforts that everyone in this country and elsewhere is having to put in, in terms of our energy crisis, that on the ground, that support for Ukraine, clearly, with British, American and weapons from elsewhere in Europe, is genuinely having an effect. It is indeed. And that's going to be interesting to unpack in the coming days, Darren, because if well, if the war stops, I suppose, then actually that could mean a lot for the British taxpayer as well as, of course, the human side of things. Um, but does Rishi Sunak has been speaking to NATO chiefs, has he, I believe? What's been going on there? Yeah, indeed. Just on my final point, I think the concern, though, of course, uh, among the West is that as we get into the winter, it gets incredibly cold in Ukraine. Both sides are essentially going to have to pause to a large degree the fighting, and that might be a chance for Russia to try and regroup. But as we hear from the MOD all the time, their ability to re-equip themselves with both troops and equipment is quite limited at the moment. Uh, you're right in saying that Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, uh, was in uh, London today meeting with both the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, and indeed uh, with the Prime Minister. It is a sign of unity and strength, if you like, but also some practical help as well with uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, announcing effectively uh, extra help for Ukrainian troops, including extra equipment and effectively winter clothes uh, so that they can stay warm in 
the coming uh, months. But a reiteration that the UK is not going to abandon Ukraine or indeed NATO's efforts to support Ukraine uh, through what could prove to be a very difficult uh, winter. But clearly there will be a, a real sense of morale boost, not just in Ukraine, but across the Western Alliance with today's announcements. Darren, thank you very much. Darren McCaffrey there, our political editor who is in Westminster, just reacting to some of that breaking news coming through there, which is that there is a rather large-scale Russian withdrawal taking place as we speak. In fact, it may well have just happened, really, which is that it's in Kherson, the Kherson region, one of the first areas that Vladimir Putin rolled the tanks into when the Ukrainian crisis kicked off. So what do you make of that? But back to our main story right now, which is this afternoon that the Royal College of Nursing has announced that nurses across the UK have voted to strike over pay with action expected to start by the end of the year. So back-to-back -back breaking news stories here for you on GB News. The walkout will involve members in more than half of hospitals and community terms, teams even, but emergency care will still be staffed. So they say, here's what you've been saying, and it is a bit of a hot potato in the inbox, this. I really want to get your take on it, because at the end of the day, it's you who's going to be affected by this. It's you. I do use the phrase, not users of the NHS, customers. The NHS is not free. We all pay for it. In fact, we pay 11.9% of our GDP on the healthcare system. That's some £216 billion every single year. And that amount of money is set to go up. We have a record 7 million people in England alone currently waiting for treatments on the NHS on an NHS waiting list. And I fail to understand how nurses going on strike because they want a 17.6% pay rise. That's the figure. A 17.6% pay rise just in time for Christmas, traditionally the busiest period for our National Health Service, is going to do anything to ease that particular backlog. Some would argue it makes the case for privatisation a little bit better as well. Some would argue it's only going to increase that backlog. Some would argue it's absolutely, completely and utterly immoral. However, other people say, of course, nurses did a lot for us during the pandemic, did a lot for us during the coronavirus. They do an incredible job anyway. They're understaffed and underpaid and they deserve everything they get. Your views. William says, if nursing is a vocation, then they put service before self, ethics before money. If they are motivated more by money than morality, then pursue a career in banking or financial services and not in the health service. And this is a really interesting dilemma. I alluded to it just then now, which is if you can Google your salary and your pay scale online before you go into it, if you can Google roughly how much student debt that you might be in before you go in to nursing, then actually, is it your own fault when you get in there and you look around and you go, good grief, I'm skinned? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What do you think? We've got us. Well, who else have we got here? Les says, question for you, Patrick. Will this nurses strike become a regular event every time the NHS staff want more money? Well, yes, quite possibly. And is anyone else getting the little whiff of a concerted effort to bring down a government. Now, some people will be looking at the TV screens now and going, the Tories don't need any help bringing themselves down, do they, I suppose? And there is that. But when you look at what's going on in the rail industry, you look at what's going on in the nursing industry, you look at what's going on threat and strike in education, etc. I could go on and on and on about that. Is this now part of a concerted attempt, do you think, to just bring down the Tories? Are people enough? And interestingly, Labour, for what it's worth, haven't come out and backed the strikes. In fact, Ed Miliband was speaking over the weekend and he categorically did not back the strikes. So, no matter who's in charge, does it actually mean that these strikes would go ahead? Um, I just want to keep with your views on this because I think it really is fascinating stuff. Again, it, this strike is going to take place and is due to take place right at the crucial time where the NHS is essentially needed. And Gary's been on. He says, disgrace, hang your heads in shame. You go into this profession, that's nursing, to help not cause more harm. The whole country is suffering and he says, he says that the blood of any harm caused will be on nurses' hands. What's the solution, ladies and gentlemen? That's what I want to know. What's the solution? Because do we pay them more? They had a £1,400 pay rise earlier this year, a 3% pay rise the year before that, and now they want a 17.6% pay rise. Inflation stands at roughly 12%. They want 5% on top of that. Is this a negotiating strategy? Can the government now afford to give in? Do you, as a British taxpayer, want to pay more? All of these questions, keep them coming. I am hoping that we will be able to speak from an MP, frankly, from any, any political party at some point on this very issue. That would be rather nice. In the Royal College of Nursing has announced that nurses will walk out by the end of the year in a row of a pay. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, has said that nurses voting to strike is, quote, disappointing. We're having 
further discussions with them. There's a range of issues that they've raised. Uh, but the key issue is one of fairness. Uh, we've offered £1,400. We've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body. We gave an increase last year above what most of the public sector workers received. Uh, and we also need to recognise the economic circumstances in which we currently face. Well, that was Steve Barkley talking through a potato there. But you are with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News. Coming up, as we await a decision on whether or not a, host a hotel in East Yorkshire can be used to house asylum seekers, I'm asking, if not hotels, where? Yes, that's right. Where would we put people if we can't put them in hotels? Is it tent cities in your local park? But more importantly, this legal action now. Council saying enough is enough, not in my area. We've got quite enough of these asylum seeker migrant hotels at the minute. We don't want any more. What does that mean for you in your town? Do you want your council to stand up and say, no, we've had enough of this now. We're going to take legal action and get a permanent injunction. So that means that that hotel could never be used to house asylum seekers. What do you make of that? I'll be back in a moment. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Every Friday and Sunday night from 9, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great good happening. Let him finish. Don't it be such a cranky. <laughs> That mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. OK, now, something that's coming, if it's not already arrived, in a town or city or, in some cases, village near you. It's migrant hotels. But could an end be in sight for people who, frankly, don't want them in their area? The High Court will decide this week if a hotel in North Ferriby in East Yorkshire can be used to house asylum seekers. So, the reason why this is important for you and not to the people of, uh, where was it, East Ferriby, North Ferriby, uh, is for reasons I'm about to tell you. East Riding Council applied for an injunction to prevent the Humberview Hotel being used by the Home office to house single adult males, which is, let's be honest with you, pretty much everyone who's coming over the channel. This maybe, just maybe, might set a legal precedent. It might mean that if you get wind of a hotel in your area potentially being tapped up for use like this, some kind of injunction could be brought in and that will be blocked. So, we actually went out and spoke to locals in that area a little bit earlier on. Here's what some of them had to say. It's been absolutely ridiculous because there's nowhere for them to go. They, they just... They'd end up starting walking down the main road here, you know, and there's nothing for them to do. Obviously, you know, people need somewhere to live um, and they need a, a safe location to be after what they've been through, but I think it's just the wrong, the wrong location for it round here. It's totally wrong for migrants of any descriptions. For one thing, where the hotel is, it's alone. There's nothing around it for anyone. There's a village mile and a half away. 
with one small tobacconist shop. It's nowhere for them to go, apart from the city of Hull, which is almost eight miles away. No, I'm totally in disagreement. I mean, some people would argue that there are places for them to go, but there we go. Uh, if not in hotels, where do we house these people? I want to hear from you on this, of course I do, because this is a massive issue, a massive issue for one. In towns, cities, villages, right across the UK, it's not just, I think, the fact that people don't want people to be people to be homeless. I can understand all of that. I can understand completely that people don't want people freezing in tents in the depths of winter and that people's conscience wouldn't really allow them to do that. But I know for a fact that a lot of people are getting very, very wound up at the fact that we have a homelessness problem in this country. Homeless veterans is always wheeled out as one. And hotels are being increasingly filled now with asylum seekers. Single men, it would seem as well, in a lot of cases. And people saying, well, the cost of the taxpayer every single day... Seven million quid a day, roughly. It's a lot, isn't it? To discuss this further, I am joined now by human rights lawyer Paul Gilbert. Paul, thank you very, very much. Now, either people in pretty much every town and city in the UK are going to have to buckle up and accept the fact that they have a, mi a migrant hotel in their area, or we put them somewhere else. What are the alternatives? Well, that's a very good question, and ultimately that's really a practical question. The fact of the matter is that there's a legal duty uh, on the Home Office to provide accommodation uh, for uh, these um, asylum seekers who come uh, into the country by various routes. And um, there will be a, a minimum standard that has to be met in relation to that accommodation. You know, that's why, as you rightly say, putting them in tents, freezing in local parks or, or where, wherever these tent villages, notional tent villages would be, simply wouldn't um, be right. And indeed, actually, that would be a breach of... Um, yeah. Of, of, of a right under the Human Rights Act in relation to the treatment of the uh, well, asylum seekers. So that's why you have to put them into some sort of accommodation. Just, just quickly on, on that, Paul, but just before it escapes my mind, you mentioned human rights. There, obviously, sure. I'm a human rights lawyer. It'd be weird if you didn't. But what about the human <laughs> rights of the people? What about the human rights of the people in the area? I have heard some absolute horror stories. I've been to a few of these hotels, and it's something that we cover regularly here on GP News. I've heard some absolute horror stories from residents about people not feeling safe when they're walking the streets. There are also massive concerns about the safety, for example, of a, 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 a nursery school that backs onto one of the hotels that's very near where I live, as it happens. People have heard some horror stories, and I, I won't delve into them mainly because of the time of day, actually, about some of the things that have been going on, predominantly because they feel as though they don't necessarily know who a lot of these people are, because we don't know who a lot of these people are. What about the human rights of the people already living in these towns and cities not to have to go through this? Well, uh, you're really talking there about um, the commission of criminal offences, um, because I presumably that's... It's the fear of being attacked, it's the fear of um, being intimidated by... Uh, uh, an asylum seeker, I'm assuming. Uh, I mean, I'm going on what you're saying. Having a uh, picture uh, taken up her skirt on the way back from school, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a criminal offence. So um, uh, the, the fact is that the criminal law protects uh, citizens in, in those situations, and, and, and that is the way that um, th that is dealt with. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, really important in these situations to appreciate that, that, that you know, the law is a process uh, and, and it follows a, a procedure. Uh, and it, it's not, a, if you like, a guarantee that, that you're going to be walking down the street and, and, and not subject to some sort of Yeah, but, but, but do, we have to, do we have to be plonking people, you know, hundreds of them at a time, in some cases maybe a thousand, in a, in a town or city? It, we, are, we are exacerbating the sense of unsafety, aren't we? Well, when you say exacerbating people's sense of safety, I suppose ultimately that that's the, an individual's feeling about their sense of safety, uh, and and that's that's the sort of individual issue. But mm. I, you know, the fact of the matter is, you, you go back to where I started, where you, you've got a a, a legal um, duty on, on the Home Office to provide accommodation of a of a certain standard for um, the asylum seekers, uh, and 
um, uh, there's going to be a minimum standard for that. Uh, perhaps it doesn't have to be a hotel, but then it has to be something equivalent uh, to it. And I suspect that the answer is that there isn't a, an equivalent no. uh, to, to, to a hotel that's as practical as a as a hotel is. And, and uh, you know, that's why what this, this is what is happening. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what the High Court does decide in relation to this uh, yeah. challenge that's being launched. Uh, and as far as that's concerned, um, you mentioned, you know, that word precedent uh, mm. uh, earlier, Patrick, um, quite rightly, if I may say so, because uh, it, it will it will set a precedent. Um, uh, I mean, all cases are decided on their facts, but but the fact is that the, the, the High Court will, uh, in the course of deciding that case, I suspect, give guidance as to where... Mm. Uh, local councils can, or or perhaps they can't. Well, this is really important. The use of the home office by a local hotel. Yeah, it is really, really important, this bit, actually, and I'm glad you've kind of brought us back there, because this injunction, let, let's just assume it Let's assume it happens, we'll have to wait and see, but just in the world of uh, the, the, the hypothetical, let's assume that, that this hotel is granted an injunction, a permanent injunction, so that they don't ever have to house asylum seekers, or they can't ever house asylum seekers, so East Riding Council wins this particular case. Presumably, no, then... Not hotel, sorry, just Patrick, just to be clear, the council. it's not a hotel applying for the injunction, as I understand it. I think the hotel have signed a contract with the the, that's says, why. Yeah. That's why the council. It's, it's yeah, the local council. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, that exactly. Exactly that. That's why the council is, is is trying to do this. So presumably, any council now, if this case is successful, could go and try to get an injunction on a, in their area, which are, are, is a big step, really, isn't it? Because previously, a lot of councils didn't really necessarily know they could do that. I think uh, one assumes that's the case, and certainly. If the injunction is successful, and in a way, the more you look at this, the more it seems probably unlikely that it will be. Uh, but if it is successful, yes, any local council who was of the view that they did not want asylum seekers housed in hotels in their area, because, of course, the local council may decide that they do. Uh, mm. But if they didn't, then um, uh, they, I mean, they'd have to look very carefully at what the court ordered and how it ordered it, uh, mm. it, it to, to see whether or not they could rely on, on that precedent uh, uh, in support of, of obtaining a, an injunction. Or, in fact, actually, probably they'd write to the Home Office and say, look, you, you know, we don't, we object to this. Uh, don't do yeah. it. If you do, we're going to get an, object, an injunction and, you know, we'll get it because the East Riding uh, County Council got it in the mm. past. So that's probably how it would work. But well, um, uh, yes, it, it would sort it would sort the wheat from the chaff a bit. I've been, it, it would sort the wheat from the chaff a bit. I mean, I have actually been saying for quite a while actually that maybe we should be putting some of these people in areas that voted for political parties that appeared to want open borders and stuff like that. But apparently that's all a bit rum, and we all have to take our fair share. But I would have thought well, that as the say, hang on a minute, you can't, Patrick, you can't say that because a particular area voted in a particular way that that's what the entire population in that area think, can you? Um, no, but I think that, I think that those areas really. should those but those areas in my view anyway should bear the brunt because the vast majority to people in that what area had that thing. Yeah, that's, that's my take on it. Anyway, uh, a bit of a Martha's Vineyard situation, one would say. But look, thank you very, very much, human rights lawyer Paul Gilbert there, who was just discussing about whether or not there's about to be a legal precedent set potentially for your area, which would mean that your local council could get in touch and essentially block migrant hotels in that area. Your views as ever, but coming up, I'll speak to a nurse who doesn't back the nurses' strike. That was a big breaking news at the top of the show. Nurse is going to walk out at the end of this year. What do you make of all of that? I'll speak to a nurse who doesn't back it. Back in a tick. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News.
Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Welcome back, everybody. It's five o'clock. This is Patrick Christie's on GB News. And this hour, the news that broke just as we were coming live on air. Nurses have voted to go on strike for the first time in more than 100 years. The Royal College of Nursing says this action will be as much for patients as it is for nurses. I very much doubt that that's actually true. How do you feel about that? GB News at GBNews.uk. Do nurses deserve a whopping 17.5% pay rise? Or, if they go on strike, will they have blood on their hands? Also this hour, Suella Braverman has called on police officers to not get sidetracked by woke, politically correct distractions. The home set claimed there's no such thing as petty crime. She wants them to get tough, get coppers out of the classroom and onto the streets. Is it about time that we got tougher on crime? And on a day that a protester attempted to turn King Charles into an omelette by throwing eggs at him during a walkabout in York, it's the perfect time to ask if the monarch should give in to activists and apologise, get this, apologise for the slave trade. Yes, that's right. That's what people want him to do, apparently. Get in touch. GB Views at GBNews.uk. We're going to have an absolute firecracker of a final hour on this show. We've got nurses, we've got policing, we've got a big slave trading debate as well. So, shit, it's the news. Patrick, thank you and good evening to you. The top story on GB News today. The Royal College of Nursing has announced the first national strike action in its 106-year history. The RCN says the strike will affect the majority of NHS employers in the UK as nurses take action against pay levels and patient safety concerns as well. The union's 300,000 members were urged to vote for industrial action. However, emergency care will not be affected. The health secretary, Steve Barclay, says nurses' pay demands are out of step with economic circumstances. The key issue is one of fairness. Uh, we've offered £1,400. We've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body. We gave an increase last year above what most other public sector workers received. Uh, and we also need to recognise the economic circumstances in which we currently face. The Prime Minister insists he didn't know about specific concerns over Sir Gavin Williamson when he appointed him to the Cabinet. The MP left his post last night, saying allegations of bullying were becoming a distraction to the good work of the government, adding he denied any wrongdoing. Speaking at PMQs, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, criticised Sir Gavin and questioned Rishi Sunak's judgment. The truth is simple. He's a pathetic bully. But he would never get away with it if people like the Prime Minister didn't hand him power. So does he regret his decision to make him a government minister? Mr Speaker, I obviously regret appointing someone who has had to resign in these circumstances. But I think... But I think what the British people would like to know is that when situations like this arise, that they will be dealt with properly. And that's why, and that's why it is absolutely right that he resigned. The Home Secretary is urging police chiefs to focus on what she calls common-sense policing and not politically correct distractions. Speaking at a conference in Westminster, Suella Bravman said the public expected the police to be tackling crime, not debating topics such as gender on Twitter. Ms Bravman also urged the force to reconsider police action that could be seen as woke behaviour. I've asked my officials to revisit the issue of non-crime hate incidents as a first step. 
as I want to be sure that we are allowing you to prioritise your time and your energy to deal with the threats to people and their property. And as you've been hearing, a 23-year-old man has been arrested after throwing eggs at King Charles and Camilla, Queen Consort, in York. The incident happened as they arrived at York Minster to unveil a statue of the late Queen. It's understood a protester threw three eggs at them, all of which missed them. Several police officers at Micklegate Bar were seen restraining a suspect on the ground immediately afterwards. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg has visited Downing Street to, make, to meet the Prime Minister. He's the first international leader to visit since Rishi Sunak entered number 10. Mr Sunak described NATO as the cornerstone of UK security. Speaking outside number 10, Mr Stoltenberg said the UK's support has been essential over Ukraine. Victories, uh, the gains the Ukrainian armed forces are making, belongs to the brave, courageous Ukrainian uh, soldiers, but of course the support they receive from the United Kingdom, from NATO allies and partners is also essential. So the support we deliver, including the training I saw this morning here in the United Kingdom, is essential, it will continue. Two people have been arrested and a police officer has been injured after responding to a climate protest on the M25 this morning. Essex police said there was a collision between a motorbike and two lorries in a rolling roadblock put in place because an activist was on the motorway. It's the third day of action on the UK's busiest motorway, with Just Stop Oil saying its supporters climbed onto overhead gantries in multiple locations on the M25 this morning. The Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, told GB News protesters are causing mass disruption. We have COP27 going on. If you are serious and want to be constructive about climate change, about making those changes, then if you are serious about that, you should be going to COP27. You should be constructively engaging with that dialogue, um, not sticking yourself to parts of the M25. That's it. You're up to date on GB News. More news as it happens now. Back to Patrick. Do you back a nurse's strike? It's now out of the world, the hypothetical, into reality, ladies and gentlemen, because that is the big breaking news. In fact, it broke literally as I opened the door to the studio and sat down here. So there we go. The health secretary says it is disappointing that nurses have now voted to strike. He's warned that action will lead to patients facing delays to care. I suspect deaths as well. Earlier this afternoon, the Royal College of Nursing announced that nurses will walk out by the end of the year in a massive row over pay. That pay is interesting, people. 17.6% is the pay rise they want. The government at pains to point out it gave them a 1,400 quid pay rise this year, a 3% pay rise. The the year before that. In the lead up to the ballot results, the government said that it had contingency plans for dealing with any industrial action by nurses. It remains to be seen exactly what those are. Is it agency staff? That will cost us a lot more. Are we going to rope in people from the military, for example? Shadow Health Secretary West Streeting, by the way, Labour have not actually come out in support of these strikes, so their policy, classic, is as yet unknown, accused the government of unacceptable negligence. Let's now speak to a nurse who works on the front line for the NHS. It's Naomi Bennett. Naomi, thank you very, very much. Great to have you on the show. Um, where are you on this nurses' strike issue, then? I've got to be honest with you, not a huge amount of support for it in the inbox in front of me at the moment. A lot of people saying times are tough, 17.6% pay rise, absolute joke. Yeah, so, um, I, um, obviously, being a nurse myself, um, I went to university and um, trained to, to keep patients from harm and to do good. And uh, my opinion on the subject is that um, nurses, I won't be walking out on my patients because I'm there for the patients. Um, I think I'm quite shocked at the way in which the nurse regulator is in support of um, patients walking out and placing their um, patients at harm because um, the, the nursing regulator has struck off some nurses um, for incidents where no patients came to harm. However, they, they were judged on potential harm. So I think um, it's a little bit hypocritical of the NMC to support nurses walking out and um, putting their That's patients at harm. You've just made an absolutely great point, and it's one I wanted to ask about, which is I am not sure what would happen legally 
if somebody died or came to serious harm as a result of strike action. And if a nurse who was supposed to be on that very shift, say, in that very department, in that very ward, had walked out on strike and somebody dies or becomes seriously ill, presumably that could lead to negligence claims. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think, like I said, um, the NMC generally judges nurses on not only actual harm, but the risk of harm. So it just seemed very contradictory that the NMC is supporting such action. Also, we've got to take into account the catastrophe and the devastation that um, COVID left us dealing with. So there's already cuts, there's already people um, suffering and worried about the future of their health. I just don't think it's responsible for nurses to walk out um, and leave the, you know, and also how are they going to fill this gap? Then they're then going to have to take on agency nurses who obviously get paid free time Times more than your average NHS staff. So I think it's um, it really, I think it should have been, a, they should have put a lot more thought into it. And any um, union that supports that action, I think they um, are irresponsible. Do you think it should be illegal for nurses to strike? I don't think it needs to be that push that forward where we've got laws where that say that nurses shouldn't be able to strike. But I think nurses have got an ethical duty to their patients. And if walking out is going to even put one patient at risk, I don't think it's something that should be considered. Yeah, indeed. Now, in terms of the pay, I'm just going off what the Royal College of Nursing's own website says. It says a, 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 an average of around 33 grand. OK, I understand there's a scale on that. Is that a fair wage? The wages with nursing um, is is um, it, it, it's not always the same. So there's some things that nurses can do in order to get promotion and um, you know get paid better wages. So in my organisation, Equality for Black Nurses, we've got lots of black and brown nurses that are being blocked from even getting up to top management. Um, and they don't have that opportunity mm. to um, go up the ladder. So I think there is lots of opportunities for nurses. They can diversify. You know, you can go and work for, um, you know, uh, an outpatient. There's lots of there's lots of choices within um, mm. within nature. So you know, um, I, I just feel that people have got to um, expand on their options. Yeah, so, uh, look, reading between the lines from what you just said there, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you don't think that the pay situation is maybe as catastrophic as is being made out. Can I ask you another question, which is that during the pandemic, the NHS was under massive strain and there was a period of time, clearly, where we all thought, flipping out, maybe the world's going to end. We didn't quite know what COVID was at that particular point. And... We made a lot of sacrifices. Everyone made a lot of sacrifices. We locked down. People lost businesses. People didn't see loved ones, etc. And the primary reason for that was obviously to protect the NHS. Uh, do you feel now that this nation owes nurses something? So well done for everything that went on during the pandemic. As a result of that hard work and what happened there, you now deserve wallop 17.6% pay rise. I think what, what it is, is we're all recovering from a crisis and I think we all need to stick together so that we can make sure that patients get the best outcome. You know, like I said, nursing is a vocation, but nurses do have to live. We do have to survive. However, like I said, there is avenues that nurses can take in order to diversify. You know, we've got banding system. So, so I think, um, yeah, I, I personally, my, my overall opinion is that I don't think that it's the best way to, no. to make it uh, stand. Just just quickly, one more to you, if that's all right. Now, I'm very concerned, obviously, as clearly you are, because you're not going off track, about the quality of patient care. The Nurses' Union now, the RCN, has decided to slightly shift, go away from it, essentially just being about the money, to now saying actually it's as much about the patients as it is because they're saying we can't retain enough nurses, we can't recruit enough nurses, therefore, if patients want good care, what we have to do is pay the nurses more. I would argue that's quite a shrewd marketing strategy in order to get people to back your cause, personally. But let's talk about the patient care potentially in the run-up to Christmas. When I work down the list of some, quotes non-essential treatments that could be affected, 
Some chemotherapy treatments and some dialysis treatments are on that list. And people, is it an exaggeration to say people will die as a result of this strike, do you think, whether it's in the short term or the long run? Well, well the whole point in strike action is to make an impact. Mm. Now, if that impact includes the death or the suffering of one person, that's too much. So as far as I'm concerned, you are creating a risk and it's not worth the risk. Um, so no, I, I, I still support, um, I don't think it's right that nurses put their patients at potential risk. And like I said, again, I don't think the nursing regulator is, is um, behaving reasonably in supporting nurses to put their patients at risk. Look, Naomi, thank you very much. Thank you for making the time for us. Thank you for all that you do, keeping people safe and alive. And thank you for working through this strike as well. And I would love to talk to you again down the line. It won't be the last time I get you on. Naomi Bennett there, who is on the front line of the NHS, who works as a nurse. What do you make of that? I think it's nice to have a little bit of sanity, actually, isn't it? GBviews at GBnews. Dot UK. It's that nurses' strike. Those you've been getting in touch. I'm going to go to those views very, very shortly. What do you make of it? Do you feel as though you're being let down? It would appear that way. A lot of people in the inbox at the moment saying that they feel as though they are being let down. I don't back them at all. The pay rise that they are wanting is ridiculous. This is from Archie. We will never get inflation down if everybody gets a pay rise that they want. Archie making a decent point there, which is that actually does paying nurses a 17.6% pay rise actually help to solve the inflation issue? And it certainly doesn't help to improve patient care. So there we go. Now, moving away, the Home Secretary, Swella Braverman, is facing calls from a number of police and crime commissioners across the country to get new officer recruits out of the classroom and on the beach. So we're going from nurses' strikes to law and order. Two big issues for the vast majority of you at home or listening in your car or whatever you're doing. They say that regulations requiring new recruits to undertake three years of study is likely to endanger the government's plan to, look, let's be honest with you, replace the 20,000 coppers that they actually biffed not so long ago. Essentially, what they're saying is that it's taking too long to train police officers and they're going to have to go through too much red tape in order to get them out on the street. I've asked this pretty simple question, which is, do you really look at people and think, if you haven't got a degree you are thicker than someone who has got a degree. There's a million different reasons why someone might not have a degree. And frankly, sometimes it's not worth it when you look at the amount of debt that they're getting. Do you care about the man or woman who turns up, knock on your door after you've been burgled to try to investigate that, has a degree in uh, history or Latin or something? Does that help them be a police officer? Is it better to just fast track coppers and get them out on the beat? And frankly, when they do get on the beat as well, are they held back? by the woke lot. This is what Swella Braverman had to say. Get out of this. We've recruited more than 50,000 additional officers. So we are well on the way to 20,000. I've met some of these new officers and it's great to see their enthusiasm uh, for their new careers. Some not far from here in the safer neighborhood team within the Met. The College of Policing has been working hard to raise the standards of initial entry and ensure that officers are equipped to meet the challenges of policing today. And we know that to build public confidence, we must draw from the widest pool of talent across all sections of society. OK, so do you feel safe on your streets at the moment? This is one of the big issues. Do you feel as though if you are involved in some form of crime or the victim, crucially, of crime, do you feel as though that's going to get dealt with? Plenty of people are committing crimes Pretty safe, they would argue, in the knowledge that they're not going to get caught. Look at rampant knife crime, rampant drug dealing, etc., etc., etc. I mean, even grooming gangs, for goodness sake. I mean, they seem to have been operating with absolute complete and utter impunity in pretty much every major city in the UK for years. But there we go. Someone who led this letter on the Home Secretary is Hampshire Police and Crime Commissioner, regular here on GB News, is Donna Jones. Donna, great to see you. Thank you very, very much. Look, just when it comes to this now, what's the most important issue? Is it about getting police officers... Who, people filling in a form to say, I want to be a police officer, to get in the fastest possible time you can to getting them out on the street stopping crimes. Is that the main issue? Yeah, I mean, certainly. I've been with the Home Secretary, Patrick, as you've just said today, in Westminster at the Conference Centre, where she delivered an absolute blinding speech, if I can say so myself. Now, she happened 
happens to be a Hampshire MP. Her constituency is Fairham, so I've known Suella and worked with her for a number of years. And when she became Home Secretary the first time, I sat down with her and I went through a number of key issues facing British policing at the moment, one of which is the crisis in senior police leadership. And secondly, is the problem of getting the right quality of police officers through the door uh, and the police degree, the police entry degree, making that a mandatory requirement from March of next year that every single new recruit must do that degree is putting off the kind of quality of police officers that we need. Now, in my patch in Hampshire, we're home to the Royal Navy, we're home to the British Army. There are lots and lots of capable men and women who've served Queen and now King who are retiring from their profession at the end of their commission in either the Army or the Navy, and of course the Air Force as well, would love to go into policing, but they don't want to do a degree perhaps in their early or mid-40s. So for me, she spoke about common sense policing. She spoke getting, getting back to basics. She knows that we need a mixture coming into policing. Yes, we need academics to be helping to solutionise some of those wicked problems that are facing policing in Britain today, but we also need people who are perhaps not academic, but have got a brilliant skill set to diffuse situations, to go into some quite aggressive environments on occasions, and actually having had a career in a non-academic profession mm -hmm. very often very well serves the police. Look, I think you've hit the nail on the head. We're all about trying to find practical solutions to problems here and maybe thinking outside the box. And in this case, I don't think you've got to look too far outside the box to recognise that we have a whole host of people who are born for the role of being police officers who actually would relish it, frankly, and that is veterans. And you are saying that maybe we should be looking in that way and maybe even, dare I say, some kind of fast-track veteran scheme. I don't know. What do you think? Absolutely. And I've already spoken to one of the brigadiers in Hampshire about this. The, the Army, the Navy, they are keen, they are prepped, they want to be working with British policing. And like I say, there's no better place than Hampshire because of our very strong military connections. You've obviously got places in the Midlands, very strong connections to the RAF as well. And, you know, th I, this is the news that I've been waiting for. I've been lobbying for this since I became a police commissioner 18 months ago. And then, as you know, two weekends ago, 16 police commissioners, I was one of them, wrote a letter to Suella Braverman as our Home Secretary to yeah. urge her to expedite this decision and I'm pleased she's turned up today but she spoke about a number of other brilliant things. She spoke about reviewing the non-hate crime uh, uh, um, uh, charges and the time that police spend on that. She talked about she talked about reducing serious violence by 20%. She spoke about ensuring, we've talked about burglaries before, that all burglaries are responded to. She spoke about the importance of local policing, neighbourhood policing. It's all very well in good the cops running around catching murderers rapists burglars etc but we need to make sure that we're doing the the basics giving public what they need for the taxes that they're paying it for me it was it was a perfect speech she delivered today i thought she, i thought she was brilliant yeah i've got a massive concern really for, i've got a massive concern for Suella, which which is that i think that the left can't stand her and they absolutely cannot stand her because they can't get their heads around the fact that she actually believes what she's saying, and she does want to do things like cut down on illegal immigration. She does want to do things like cut down on what's going on in the channel. She does want to do things like get wokeism essentially out of police and get common sense back into policing, and they can't handle it. And I'm worried now that they've got Gavin Williamson. All right, look, no one's going to miss Professor Snape too much, but they're going to come back for Suella now. How do you think that actually what she's seeing is a pushback? Because a lot of people on the left just can't handle it. Well, it's, this is the difference, isn't it, between some sections of society and the public. And I think the great British public likes Suella Braverman. I think they like the fact that she's saying she's going to get tough on, um, you know, the people traffickers, the migrant boats. I think they like the fact that she's saying less woke policing, more time spent on practical neighbourhood crimes. Um, mm. She talked about tackling knife crime. She talked about the scourge on drugs. She talked yeah. about addressing and speeding up rape investigations and prosecutions. But concerned. the words she repeated throughout that speech were back to basics, common sense policing. Uh, and she also talked about simplifying the way that you record crime crimes um, and you record the outcomes of crime. She wants to get under the skin of some of those red tape issues as well. So, you know, she she was she was practical, she was to the point, she was yeah. well briefed as you would expect. Um, and she delivered today to nearly every chief con constable uh, in the country and every police and crime commissioner and the National Crime Agency and the College of Policing and Home Office officials. She delivered a speech today that, that rang to the hearts of many of us.
Well, which is exactly what you want, and not people there who um and ah about whether or not we should be doing stop and search and whether or not it's got connotations for this, that and the other. Someone who wants to get right in amongst it and deal with various problems that are in her brief. Thank you very much, Donna Jones. Always an absolute pleasure. Donna Jones there, of course, the Hampshire Police and Crime Commissioner. Oh, not holding back when it came to her rather positive assessment of Suella Braverman. Mark my words, I'm telling you now, the Labour Party and the people on the left, they just can't handle it. They cannot handle the fact that Suella Braverman is an ethnic minority who actually believes in what she's saying. There we go. You are with me, Patrick Christie's on GB News, coming up as we await a decision as to whether or not a hotel in East Yorkshire can be used to house asylum seekers. I am asking, if not hotels, where? And get this, people, all right, the Home Office, Sweller again, have got a duty to house these people, supposedly. I'm wondering whether or not that should change. But does it have to be hotels? Where else can they do it? And you should be watching this one very closely because every chance there's an asylum seeker hotel in your town and your city. And if the people of East Riding, the council there, manages to win this legal precedent in the High Court, then frankly, that might stop something taking place in your neck of the woods as well. I'll be back in a moment. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome back, wonderful people. We've had the absolute lot of it so far today, haven't we? The breaking news right at the top was that nurses have voted to go on strike. That's wound you up no end. Also, big announcement from Suella Bradman on policing. She wants to fast-track people to get more bobbies on the beat to make you safer. But Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has said that Britain is looking to do a lot more with France when it comes to tackling the small boats crossing the Channel. A couple of big issues on the migrant stuff at the moment because we've got hotels being used left, right and centre to house asylum seekers. Now there could be a legal precedent. It's coming through the High Court that will decide if a hotel in North Ferriby, which is in East Yorkshire, can be used to house asylum seekers. So the council itself, East Riding Council, applied for an injunction to prevent the Humberview Hotel, sounds lovely, doesn't it, being used by the Home Office to house single adult males, which, let's be honest, is the vast majority of people coming over the channel. This could mean now that a council near you could do the same thing, potentially, if indeed it's successful. It'd be fascinating. I would expect more and more of them to do it because now the cost of these things, because you haven't seen local social care services, local education services, local policing services, etc., 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 being gobbled up as a result of having to look after these people in your area. And it's not just one hotel, it'll be two, it'll be three, it'll be four. The big question, of course, is where on earth do we put them, though, if we don't put them in hotels? Ben Wallace there saying he wants to do more deals with the French, which presumably would stop them coming over here. 
I'll believe it when I see it. But earlier on, we actually went to this particular patch, we went to North Ferriby, to speak to people on the ground, locals in the area, about how they felt about the fact that this migrant hotel might now be permanently blocked. It's been absolutely ridiculous, because there's nowhere for them to go. They, they just... They'd end up starting walking down the main road here, you know, and there's nothing for them to do. Obviously, you know, people need somewhere to live um, and they need a, a safe location to be after what they've been through, but I think it's just the wrong, the wrong location for it round here. It's totally wrong for migrants of any descriptions. For one thing, where the hotel is, it's alone. There's nothing around it for anyone. There's a village a mile and a half away with one small tobacconist shop. It's nowhere for them to go, apart from the city of all, which is almost eight miles away. No, I'm totally in disagreement. Yeah, what an absolutely fantastic little statement that was by that chap, because this is happening time and time again, and it's an element of this that seems to go under the radar. The Home Office, as far as I can tell, in an attempt to disguise, maybe, exactly how many migrant hotels there are, is plonking them out in very rural, remote locations in some cases. Now, the negative impact of that is absolutely massive. Firstly, the population of that particular village might be smaller than the population of the amount of people that you've got in a hotel. Secondly, there's nothing for them to do all day. So you end up with these people just loitering around your local area, and then, of course, it maximises the opportunity for people to get up to no good, and it doesn't exactly do much, does it? It doesn't do wonders for public relations. But let's just assume that this injunction goes through. A permanent injunction to stop this particular hotel in, uh, in Yorkshire, which one would imagine will set a legal precedent in wherever you are as well, to stop it being used for migrants and asylum seekers. The question then becomes, where do we put these people? I think it's fair to say that the French, no matter how much money we lob at them, are going to do precious little stopping these boats. I don't believe for a single second that another 80 million big ones to old Emmanuel Macron is going to do much about that. So the question really now becomes, where do we put these people, if not in hotels? Joining me now is international human rights lawyer David Hay. David is a friend of the show. It's great to have you back on. Thank you very, very much. Look, bit of a sticky wicket, this, isn't it? Because what happens if all of a sudden local councils can come out and they know they can get something in the High Court that says this particular hotel, permanent injunction, no use for migrant hotels, what do we end up with? Do we end up with tent cities in local parks? What's the human rights of that? I mean, I think, I mean, as, as, um, as, as we know, the asylum system is broken um, and, it, and it needs fixing in, in every single element. And it's not just one element that needs fixing. You know, it's good to see that Ben Wallace is talking about France, but will, it, will anything happen from that? And, and you, you know, if the, the, the councils are successful, I don't think they will be, but if they are, that does set a precedent, which, of course, the councils are going to use. Um, I mean, even down here in Cornwall, you know, the, the news of when um, refugees have gone to a hotel in Cornwall, um, very, very kind of anti, anti that, the, the, the local news. So you're going to have lots and lots of those problems. But like you said, where do you put them now? From a legal perspective, we have a duty under current legislation, which may or may not be reformed with whichever Home Secretary may be in next week or the week after, we have current duties to house asylum seekers. So if we can't put them in hotels in any particular county or elsewhere, we can't put them in, as you said, tent cities, then mm. we need to have another, another, an, an, another option. And one thing that, 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 that I think, and I've seen other people comment on, is if we look back to the, 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 the COVID crisis back in 2019, when we built all of those Nightingale hospitals rather quickly at great expense and never really used them. Yeah. It's something that we could perhaps consider in terms of locating large numbers of, of, of migrants while their asylum seeker process is going through. And we can actually make things quicker, perhaps, if we do that. But that's just one idea. But I think it's, like I said, it's just the whole system is broken yeah. and needs urgent reform. I know, I, I, look, I agree completely. And the Nightingale hospital angle on this is something that gets raised a lot with my viewers and listeners, which is, well, I suppose we could do that. I mean, the reality is a lot of people don't necessarily want that done at all, but maybe it's better than the hotel in your local village being used because it's the knock-on effect of, was that hotel used for weddings, for example? Did it used to have a restaurant and a bar in it, the local economy? All of this stuff, that's before you get stuck into safety. Just explain to everyone watching this now, how could, if we wanted to, the law be reformed so that, what, we, we essentially wouldn't have a duty to look after these people, is that right? Well, the, 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 the current... Re the reason why we're having all these legal challenges, the reason why the laws are there in the first place, 
ultimately come from the Human Rights Act, which comes ultimately from, 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 the, from the EU. That, as we know, is subject to being replaced by the Bill of Rights. It hasn't happened yet. So we, we, we don't know how that's going to result. But it's that legislation that all these challenges are ultimately coming from, um, the, the, the Human Rights Act. So to change what's happening now, you would need to change the law. And as we know, that's under process, but we don't yet know the detail of, of, of the, the, the new so-called Bill of Rights law, um, particularly, obviously, with, with the, the ever-changing Home Secretaries. Mm. And just very lastly, I'm not sure if this is in your brief, but I'm keen to get to the bottom of this because people talk to me about this all the time. They say, what about my human rights? They say this thing of, well, do I not have the human right to not feel potentially a bit threatened when I walk down the street? Do I not have the human right for the government to not necessarily create what could be perceived as quite a large security risk in my town or village? We don't know who all of these people are. That's fair enough. Quite a lot of these locations I've been to too, for example, where there's been a nursery school that's backed on at the end of it. That is an added risk in your area. Do the people of that area not have a human right to not be exposed to that risk? I think it's, it's something you always see in, 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 in human rights legislation and law around the world. There are always competing interests. Who's this stronger, you know, which human right effectively, from one of the best phrases, stronger than the other one? I mean, now, if people can show that by asylum seekers being placed in their local community, that one of their human rights, which they're also entitled to, has been breached, then of course they can go through a, 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 a similar process. But then it will just be, as you can imagine, just yeah. le le lawyers and legislation everywhere. David, look, thank you very much. Always an absolute pleasure. David Haig there, human rights lawyer, international human rights lawyer, no less. Great stuff. That, what do you make of that? I can see now, I can sense a load of you quickly getting in touch with your legal team, going, right, my human rights have been infringed. Let's do something about this. But coming up, I will ask, is it dangerous that nurses are going on strike? That was the big breaker right at the top of the show. Nurses are going on strike. It's happening right in the busiest period, coming up to Christmas. Thank you very much. They want a 17.6% pay rise. Your views on that, ladies and gentlemen. Loads of you have been getting in touch. And get this, we're going to get a glimpse of Matt Hancock in the jungle tonight, OK? He suggests that he might not be over, overly comfortable if he comes face to face with snakes. So my producers thought it would be a great idea to bring a snake into the studio and essentially have it try to choke me to death. Stay tuned. Not looking forward to that. Patrick, thanks very much indeed. The headlines this hour. The Royal College of Nursing has announced its first national strike in the 106-year history of the group. The RCN says the action will affect the majority of NHS employers in the UK as nurses walk out over pay and patient safety concerns. The union's 300,000 members were urged to vote in favour of industrial action, but it's understood emergency care won't be affected. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, has described the decision as disappointing. The key issue is one of fairness. Uh, we've offered £1,400, we've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body. We gave an increase last year above what most other public sector workers received. Uh, and we also need to recognise the economic circumstances in which we currently face. The Prime Minister insists he didn't know about specific concerns over Sir Gavin Williamson when he appointed him to the Cabinet. The MP left his post last night, saying allegations of bullying are becoming a distraction to the good work of government, adding he denied any wrongdoing. The Home Secretary is urging police chiefs to focus on what she's calling common-sense policing and not politically correct distractions. Speaking at a conference in Westminster, Suella Bravman said the public expects the police to be tackling crime, not debating topics such as Dwent gender on Twitter. She also urged the force to reconsider police action that could be seen as woke behaviour. A 23-year-old man has been arrested after throwing eggs at King Charles and Camilla, Queen Consort, in York. It's understood three eggs were thrown in total, all of which missed the royal couple. Several officers were at Micklegate Bar, <laughs> Micklegate Bar even, seeing, uh, and they were seen restraining a suspect on the ground immediately after the incident. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. We're back in just a tick. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice, 
We are here for you on radio, television and online. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let him well, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. OK, welcome back, everybody. Now, let's return to that big breaking news of the day. It was all too predictable. I called it on Monday, but it's actually happening right now. Nurses are going on strike. They're going to walk out by the end of the year in a row over pay. By the end of the year, realistically, let's be honest with you, means in the run-up to Christmas. Traditionally the busiest time for the National Health Service. Now, the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, has warned that the action would lead to patients facing delays to care and said that it is disappointing that they are voting to strike. I'll be having further discussions with them. There's a range of issues that they've raised. Uh, but the key issue is one of fairness. Uh, we've offered £1,400. We've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body. We gave an increase last year above what most other public sector workers received. Uh, and we also need to recognise the economic circumstances in which we currently face. Steve Bartley yet again sounded like he's talking through a potato there. But joining me now to discuss this and what the real issues are, because they're saying initially it was pay. 17.6% is the pay rise that nurses want. Yes, I know I keep repeating these figures, but it's for people who are just tuning in. A £1,400 pay rise earlier this year, a 3% pay rise the year before that. Now the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing, is focusing more on the idea of patient safety. This strike is as much for patients as it is for nurses. Well, is it really? Because some of those non-essential services that are going to be cut as a result of this strike could well include chemotherapy and dialysis and various different things like that, which are pretty essential, I think, by most people's metrics. Do someone who needs to go through chemotherapy just have to sit back, wait and see the bigger picture? Joining me now is political commentator Sam Dowler and... In, who's had a haircut since last time I saw you? And in the studio, Sarah Jane Palmer as well, who's a nurse and a writer. Look, Sarah, it would seem fitting to start with you, as indeed a nurse. Talk <laughs> to me about this. 17.6% is that figure. Where do you stand on the nurses' strike? I think it's absolutely ridiculous, to be honest. I think 17% is um, far too high. We're in a cost-of-living crisis. We've got a massive recession at the moment that everybody's facing. Everybody in society will suffer as a result of these things. And then nurses are saying, well, um, we need a, a, a pay rise of something so extortionately above um, the already extortionate inflation rate. I just think that's completely unfair on the rest of the society, on the rest of the public. Um, everybody deserves a pay rise, but mm. I don't see how a whole profession can demand that and then walk out on their patients and say, it's for patient safety. Well, we'll see about that, because once they've done it, we'll have to see the aftermath of all of that, and then it will be too late for some patients. Mm. So I just think it's it, it's morally wrong. Well, there you go. Well, that, that's, that's your view, obviously. I'll bring you back in now, Sam, Sam Dowler. Look, what's your take on this nurse's strike, then? Because people, some people think it, it, they would have blood on that. 
Well, obviously, you know, this has come from the nurse body. There's like 300,000 um, people in, you know, have voted and they've voted to strike. And like, and I don't think any nurse, any nurse wants to strike at all. But I mean, if you just cast your mind back to the pandemic, when, you know, when we were like banging, banging pots and pans and saying like, let's look after our nurses, here they are asking for simply like a five... Five percent over the over the rate of inflation. It's not um, simple, mate. It's seventeen point six percent in total. Right? So that's an absolute wedge. <laughs> yeah, but so, 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 like, they will look. They will look at, for example, um, I don't know, like Shell making you know extortionate amounts of, um, of 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 profit, and you know, and and the forty four billion wasted on PPE during the pandemic, and then be like, well, why you know why do, do, after you've like you know lauded us as sa saving the nation. And then still won't give us the pay that we that we that we deserve and want. I mean, come on, my my partner works in the care sector, which is even more poor, poorly like funded. And mm. you know, when like these people are doing the jobs that nobody wants to do, they're looking after like the nation and you know, elder people, like disabled children, disabled like you know. And it, come on, give them the okay. pay they deserve. They they're doing the rest of Europe, so why don't they do it here? Well, that's well, that's that's interesting and. It boils down to Sarah, Sarah Jane Palmer, who is, of course, uh, a nurse. Are nurses already paid enough for the job they do, in your view? I think that nurses are very well paid, actually, yes. And they have a, a very good banding um, system. So you start at band five. Yes, at the lowest amount in London, it's about 32,000. I think that's pretty good as a starting salary. And then it can go all the way up to about 38. And then you can move up to band six, band seven, band eight. You've got a really good career progression structure there. And um, you've got a good pension and various other benefits. I, I never once complained about my salary. And I was on far less when I started about 10 years ago I was on about 24,000 in central London okay. so I think what they've got at the moment okay. is, is quite good. Okay Sam the timing of it as well when the cost of living crisis which is affecting everyone pretty much apart from obviously the, 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 the wealthier that you mentioned earlier on and I do take your point about when it comes to yeah you know, there being economic inequality in this country yeah absolutely but it was ever thus and the timing of it when it comes to the Christmas period as well it does appear as though it has been done to try to maximise the damage to patient safety as opposed to actually improve it? Well, I think, I mean, this, we're not in the Christmas period just yet. So, I mean, let's let's not jump the gun there. I mean, it's, we're not like, we're not talking about like, you know, like old old people, you know, dying over Christmas. Yeah. And they've already and they've already and they've already said that um, you know, that emergency care won't you know, won't be affected. And also, like, you know, the nurses, you know, we've, we've seen on this programme, many other programmes, that nurses will not turn away from patients and be like, sorry, you're not going to get the care that we said we're going to give you. So, oh, I mean, are. you know, you'll make it... I don't know if Sarah's making out that nurses are greedy or, like, I mean, they just want more money. I mean, like, of course, of course they do, but they, they we have to, like, they, they have to pay for their own parking. And, like, you know, this is a cost of living crisis as well. So, like, you know, why why shouldn't they be paid? Like, these, this is the backbone of British society, of of course, they need to be paid what 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 they deserve, and like you know, and it is. I think you know, as I said before, like just, they wouldn't do this. They absolutely had to. I get that, Sam. I'm just going to stick with you, Sam, before I give the final word over to Sarah. Sam, look, I I, I really hope that you're in you're in rude health and all of your loved ones are. But there are a lot of people at the moment who are not and who are maybe waiting for what the seven million people in England, for example, who are on an NHS waiting list at the moment. Some of those people, one would imagine, for things like chemotherapy, etc. It's a horrible question to ask. I hope you'd take it in the right tone, which is, look, if you were waiting for chemotherapy treatment and that was delayed as a result of the nurses' strike, do you think you'd still have the same views that nurses are right to strike? Well, actually, my father was going through chemotherapy up until oh, December, just, just until December last year, where he did pass away, sadly. And I know that um, that he would he would support what the nurses were doing, even 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 if it meant he was slightly delayed. Of course, I, I don't, yeah. and I don't think they are. You know, they're not doing this with a, with a view to you know like yeah. holding people to ransom when it comes to chemotherapy or or, or like you know everyday treatment. They, this is literally a last resort, and I and I and I don't think there I don't think there's a nurse in the country that would that would that would want to like you know turn their back on patients you know just because they wanted an extra buck here and there. This is, you know, this is very important to them, and like, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't vote to do this otherwise. Okay, all right. Very sorry to hear about your father. Terrible stuff. That uh, Sarah, I'll give you the last word on this now, which is, 
Anki, is, is there any other ways that we can make cost-saving measures? A lot of people say to me, well, maybe it's got a bit of a bloated management structure. Something like 11.9% of our GDP goes on our healthcare system. If you add that up, it's around 216 billion quid, which is a lot of money. Mm. Can that expenditure be done better? Can that money be managed more wisely? Yeah, surely. I think um, through getting rid of some of the managerial positions that really aren't needed and doing a root and branch ana analysis of the system to see what's not working and then mm. scrapping that, you'd save absolutely loads of money. And you could also fund the social care sector better and then the patients that don't need to be in the acute sector can be moved into the social care sector, freeing up space in the hospitals and also freeing up pressures on staff. So it's a win-win all round. That, so it could, it could be done. So, to, mm. But that, that, the responsibility of how that money is spent is surely on the people who are already in the NHS, isn't it? I would have thought. Sorry. Just it's the responsibility of, of how that money is spent, so i.e. making sure it's spent better. Yeah, yeah. It's people who are in the NHS. Yeah, absolutely. I think there should be cost saving all round in the NHS and um, there should be um, education for all staff on how to cut okay. costs and within the senior managerial structure they need to have that conversation. Look, both of you, thank you very much. A really, really good spirited discussion on what is the biggest news topic of the day, frankly, which is that nurses are going to be striking unless something drastic happens. Sam Dowler, thank you very, very much. Political commentator and Sarah Jane Palmer, thank who's a nurse and a writer, thank you very much for coming into the studio. Right, we're going to go to your views now, people. GB Views at GBNews.uk. A load of you have been getting in touch on this very issue. You can see at the bottom of your screens there, this nurse's strike. It's going to be a whopper and it's time, some would argue, to maximise patient damage. But other people, i.e. some of the nurses strike, you say, we're doing it for patient care. It's got nothing to do with the 17.6% pay rise that we want. No, this is all about patient care. A lot of people are saying that this is uh, is wrong. I'm a nurse with 30 years experience though. This is now this is this is interesting. It's from Rosemary. Thank you very much. I have a few points to make. Rosemary says she doesn't agree with the proposed strike or the rise that is being demanded. She won't take strike action, but a reasonable pay increase would be welcome. And I hope that maybe this is what happens. That the idea for a 17.6% pay rise is just kicked into the long grass because I, I, I think that is nuts. I really do because I don't see where that ends, OK? But maybe a little bit of a pay rise, a bit more of a pay rise in order for us to not have a uh, nurse's strike. Now, I'm very sorry if it just seemed like I was a bit thrown there or if you saw a little bit of a, a grimace sneaking across it. It's because I get to see what's happening just off camera and I have been joined in the studio by Snaky Sue. Former Health Secretary Matt Hancock has promised that the public will see the real me on I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here, as he accepted again that his career in government is over. Not before time, little Matty Hancock. Anyway, Hancock's arrival in the jungle was teased by host Anton Deck at the end of last night's episode. The 44-year-old said, lots of people have a view on me from being health secretary in the pandemic, dealing with some very difficult issues. Yeah, quite badly, actually. Um, he also confessed that he is scared of snakes. So, my producers, who I treat appallingly, it must be said, the shouting, the screaming, I brought a taser into work one day and they don't like me to bring up the cattle prod incident, decided this would be a good idea now, a good vehicle, a vessel, if you will, in order to scare the living daylights out of me with a real-life snake in the studio. Let me welcome Snakey Sue. There we go. Hello. She joins me now. Thank you very much, Snakey Sue. You're very welcome. Great to have you on. And you've brought a friend with you. Yes. So, so what, what, is, what is this? Her name's Rezzy and she's a Brazilian rainbow boa. And poisonous? No, no, that, that's, that's the wrong word. Venomous. Venomous, sorry. Not venomous. Sorry, not <laughs> venomous. OK, right, now, the reason we <laughs> wanted to do this is because Matt Hancock, some would argue, is a bit of a snake, but uh, is going to encounter snakes, not this kind of snake, but snakes a bit yeah, like this. They go to Australia, don't they? Yes. So it might be a carpet python or something. And how deadly are they? No, not really. That's a shit. Okay. No. Um, so, so this this little critter now, um, I, I believe what we're going to try and do is is would it is it possible to to get the snake on me? Yes. Come on then. If you want to? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so, and and how do these uh, how do these snakes normally go about um, like attacking their prey and stuff? Well, they strike and constrict. What? <laughs> when you say strike and constrict, when was? They strike at the at yeah. prey. OK, yeah, fine, good stuff. So if you're listening on radio, just watch on the telly <laughs> instead. They strike it's, at the prey. It's really... It's what's happening now is I can feel the snake constricting quite aggressively around my wrist. 
What she's so there we go, and it feels it feels really, really tight. <laughs> so it, it chokes its prey, does it? And Matt Hancock might have to go through this. What she's really doing is she's holding on because she otherwise she doesn't want to fall on the floor. Is it you sure? Is that just, <laughs> it's not just what she tells you because it is starting to feel a little bit like she might be. Uh, okay, she... fantastic. Do they make a good pet? Yes, they can do if mm. you know how to react with them. And so, what should I absolutely not do now? Make any sudden movements or anything? You can you can support her. Okay, great. So Gently. how did you get so into Snake Snakey Sue? I rescued them for, since oh. 1996. People's unwanted pets. Oh hello. Oh, this is rather cute. Actually, I've got got his little tongue on me. Um, right. Okay. Fantastic. Well, and um, and can you 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 educate people about snakes? I do, do you? Can't help but feel like it's starting to go around my neck a little bit now. <laughs> um, now Michelle <laughs> Jubery joins me in the studio. I do. I've encountered bigger snakes than this, I've got to say, in my life. OK, all right. That, that doesn't sound quite right, does no, it? No, it doesn't but, uh, sound quite right. I mean... Did you set this up, Michelle? No, I didn't. Can we have a stroke of the snake? Yeah, stroke the snake. Stroke the snake. Is, this, is the first just safe? Just uh, what's coming up on your show, Michelle, just while yeah. you uh, stroke the snake? Well... Hang on. Okay. Try not to make any fast movements. Oh, well, OK. I'll be it's just it's my neck on the chopping block here, Michelle, is all I'm saying, so if you don't mind... I've got a confession to make, and you probably won't appreciate this, but what? I once ate, snake, ate a snake in Cambodia. This is you talking to Snakey Sue, who rescues snakes. snakes so, I should um, probably, uh... so, yeah, just the optics of that, Michelle. And not probably, right. yeah, okay. What's, uh, what's um, coming up on your show, Michelle? Right, oh, yes, on my shirt. Now I've got myself all frightened, because I've just made that announcement. The snake is looking at me. And it's, it's very uh, tight around my chest. Me. Anyway, Please hurry up. On my show. Uh, should the higher rate of tax be raised to 50 pence? I want oh. to talk about that. Nurses strike, is that the right thing for this country? I'm getting myself frightened now. This might be the snake's revenge on me for eating its mate or something. Um, and then, uh, what else have I got coming? I'm frightened now. Oh, uh, yeah, I've tried my best to ignore these um, lunatics, uh, the Just Stop Oil people. Um, I can't ignore them anymore, so I want no. to talk about, are these guys eco-terrorists? OK, good stuff. All right, look, uh, Snakey Sue, can I just say thank you very, very much for coming into the studio. We're going to have Go in a second now. I'm bringing what was it, Vezi? Vezi. Vezi into the studio with me. I've made a new friend. And if people want to um, get in touch with you, cheeky little plug time, okay? How yeah. that? Snakey Sue on, online. You just type in Snakey Sue and lots of stuff about me comes up. Fantastic. There we go. Right, <laughs> look, thank you very much, everybody. The link I to this. I think what would come up, by the way, if you put Snakey Sue into Google. <laughs> oh, there she is again. Yeah, well, restaurants, by the sounds of it, from what you said. <laughs> uh, right, okay, look, thank you very much, everybody who's been tuning in. This show's been absolutely bonkers, as I'm sure you can tell. I've been Patrick Christie's. I'll be back again at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Don't go anywhere because Jubes and Co is coming right your way after the weather. Ah. <laughs> Alex Deegan here with your latest weather updates after some sunshine today. Tomorrow we'll be back to being gloomier. Another very windy but very mild day as well. It's going to be very mild because tucked in between these weather fronts is some very warm air and that is heading our way. Ahead of it, it's not been cold today. But it will turn a little cooler this evening with some clearer spells, particularly across parts of the east. There are a few scattered showers around, mostly in the west. And it's going to be a very wet night in western parts of Scotland. So that rain will also at times affect North Wales, northwest England, mostly over the hills here. Much of central and eastern England will stay dry and even the rain in western Scotland will tend to peter out through the early hours. As I said, mild air is on the way. We could dip down to single figures for a time across the east, but most places double digits, if not in the teens, to start Thursday. Overall, a pretty cloudy day, but we'll see some breaks in the cloud across parts of the east. Uh, rain and drizzle at times over the Cumbrian Fells, the Snowdonia, and it will be a wet day over the Highlands, particularly wet for Skye and Lewis, where we could see a few problems from the rain. It's also going to be very windy here, but it'll be blustery everywhere but look at the temperatures. Again, it really won't feel like November. Gusty winds continue through Thursday evening. The rain peps up a little bit more again across western Scotland and for Northern Ireland as we head through the nights and into Friday. Again, for most of England and Wales, staying dry. But overnight, Thursday into Friday, temperatures in towns and cities are likely to stay in the teens. Exceptionally mild conditions. And then Friday's a similar day to Thursday. Rain at times over northwestern parts, particularly the Highlands and the Western Isles, western parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, some drizzle on western hills, but many areas will be dry but cloudy. Not quite as windy, but just as mild on Friday. Again, temperatures 14, 15, 16, perhaps even 17 degrees Celsius. It will be breezy, but these temperatures are pretty remarkable for November.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News.